Hey guys, Carl from Purple Moose Place. Today I'm going to be taking a look at Mythwind from designers Brendan McCaskill and Nathan Leash and publisher Open Owl Games. This is a sort of open world, casual, life simulation adventure kind of game in which you find yourselves as a group of people who have arrived at a new valley of Mythwind that's sort of inhabited by sprites and you sort of start to establish your town and, and go about your daily routine finding things, going on adventures, having events trigger along the way, and it's sort of supposed to be akin to games along the lines of Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing, in which you're doing things, but also sort of just living a daily life throughout time in this location, having things happen along the way. Disclaimer, I was given a review copy of this game for this video, but as always, I will do my best to give you my own honest opinion on the game. With all that said, let's head down to the table to see how this one plays, and then I'll meet you back up here to let you know what I think. To set up your first game of Mythwind, begin by placing out the town board onto the table, assembling it from the three pieces of the board. Next, you'll place out the starting season tile. There are Two double-sided season tiles in the game. First this one that is spring on one side and summer on the other, and then fall and winter on the other. We're going to start the game off with the spring season, so I'll place that there, and I'll just leave this off of the screen for now, pulling it in later when I need it. Then in these four tracks here in the bottom left corner, I'm going to place out one tracker for each of the four different types of resources. Culture, income, production, and food. Then all of the empty sort of square spaces on the board are going to be filled in with forest cards matching the number on the board. So here is card 5, card 8, card 1, and so on. There is no forest card for space 7. Instead, space 7 will be filled in with this longhouse building card. So I'm going to place that in there as well. And the four remaining slots are going to be filled in with the town action tiles that I'm just going to place in now. I'll explain later when we get into gameplay what those things do. Next, we're going to place out the starting workers in this game. And at the start of the game, we will be playing with one of each type of worker. Workers in this game are represented by these dice. The blue dice represent sp sprites and the orange dice represent villagers. So we're simply going to roll those dice making sure that some value is showing, which unfortunately right now is one and one, but that's fine, and they get placed down here in the tower space at the bottom of the board. Next, I need to set up the sort of game tray that we're gonna be using while we play. This is gonna remain off screen for most of the time, but up here I've got all of the dice that are sort of in the game. This is where I'm gonna keep the dice that are available to me later on when I pack things up. And down here, I've got all the coins sorted out. And these are going to be gold tokens that I'll explain what those do in just a minute. But we are going to start with a single card in the event deck, and that is event card number one. So I will place that right there. Next, we're going to start the game with adventure cards one through ten. So I'm going to take those ten cards, shuffle them up, place this adventure tile on top, and that will go right here in this box. Then in this first small area is the weather card stack. This weather card is stack is sort of set up in order for your first play. So that does not get shuffled, just so you can sort of get a somewhat pre-programmed order of the world at the start of your first game. So I'm just going to place that in there like that. And then finally, in this last slot, I'm going to take the first seven goal cards in the game, give those a shuffle. And I'm going to flip over the top card like that, placing that in the box just like that. And with that, we are all set up for our game tray as well. And the last thing to do before getting started is to select our characters. So for right now, I'm going to clear this off over here to the side. And I'll pull that in again as I need it. But I want to go ahead and set up my characters. And for the first season of this game, I'm planning on playing through two seasons. There are four seasons in one year, but I'm just going to play two seasons worth so you can get an idea of what's going on without showing you too much of the sort of hidden story stuff, but also so that you can get an idea of all of the things that are in this game. I'm going to play one season with the crafter and the ranger. And then for the second season, I'm going to reset and well, not reset the game, but just reset characters or switch characters and play through a single season with the farmer 
and the merchant. So you can see how all four of the characters in this game work. So for now, I'm going to start by setting up the ranger and the crafter. So first things first, I have played through this game once before and reset everything. So all of these boxes are already sort of set to go. So I'm going to start with the crafter. And then in this box, I'm going to open up all of these things in here are the crafters skills, which I'll explain a little bit later. I'm just going to set those off to the side over here. All of the request cards will come out of there all of the different material types for the crafter and then placing that back on in here there's nothing underneath that one and under here all of these dials are set to the starting level for each of them and you can see that's the level that has a one on the left side and a five coin on the right side just like that placing all of those back in and i'm going to flip this over to the other side to show some of the information we're going to use during the game. And then I'll set that board right over here to the side. And like that, we're all set up for the crafter for the most part, except that every character is going to start the game with 10 coins. So I'm going to give her five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 coins over here. And in addition, the crafter is going to start with two random goods. And then one of each good goes into her bag. So for this game, just kind of choosing at random, although not random, I'm going to start with one purple and one orange material. And then again, into the crafter's bag, I will place one of each of the five materials. And then I'm just going to place that bag off to the side of the screen for now. In addition, we need to set up the requests for the crafter. And you can see that the requests have different levels of sort of sprites printed on there. So here's two. This one has nothing. Then four, then six, and then eight. Basically, what that means is the number, or sorry, the requests that you have available in your request deck are the requests that are equal to or less than the number of sprite dice that you have in your town. So right now she doesn't have two, so she can only use the ones that are not marked with any sprites. I'm just going to set the rest off to the side then give those a shuffle and you're going to draw a number of requests equal to the number of villager dice so in this case just one so i'm going to draw that and that is my one request for right now and i'll explain how those work when we get into gameplay in just a minute but with that the crafter is all set up so let me go ahead and then set up the ranger doing the same thing that i just did with the crafter over here we've got our ranger box and again, this is sort of preset from a previous play that I did have. In here are his skills. And I kind of want to place those out of the way somewhere. Maybe down here in the corner. I'll explain all the skills in a minute. The ranger does use quite a bit of space on the screen. So I kind of want to give him as much space as we can. Up here, we're going to take out all the cards. These are all the sort of item cards. This is sort of the legend for their exploration for later on. And actually I need to move this over to the other side just to give myself more space for the ranger. And these are all of the expedition cards in three levels, one, two, and ultimately three right there. So I'll set those off to the side for right now. I will organize things a little bit better as we get into play. Under here, there's nothing. This is going to be what he uses when we save in between gameplay to keep the cards that are relevant to what I've been doing. And then finally, we're going to set the inventory marker here at the first step, which is basically telling me I can have four cards in my inventory when I go on to an expedition. But I'll explain that, of course, as we get into gameplay. And then this side of the board face up, showing this town marker, this expedition marker, and again, his pricing for the different town resources as well. Then I'm going to sort of set these here with this token there. And actually, you know what? I might as well split these into ones, twos, and threes right now. And I'm going to separate these cards into the different 
types of tool. All right, and I've placed these out sort of in the order of what they are on our board right there. And you'll notice that this one particularly has this backpack on one side and these footprints on the other side. So that one actually represents two different tools that are available for, to us in this game. Again, I will place these skills, just let's keep them over here. And I'll spread those out and show them to you and so on as we get into play. But for now, we are all set up for gameplay. So Mythwind is going to play out over a sort of unending series of turns and then rounds. And basically the rounds are seasons and then every four seasons is a year. So the seasons all reset. But ultimately on this sort of yearly four season rotation with a number of turns during each season equal to the number of weather cards that we have in this box over here because at the start of every turn we're going to begin by drawing one of those weather cards. So let me go ahead and do that right now. And the first weather card here you can see is a sunny day and over here there's a symbol in the corner. Some of these cards are going to have symbols and that symbol is going to sort of dictate something that we need to do. So in this case that symbol is showing that I need to activate an event. But before I get ahead of myself, before triggering the action or the thing that is printed on the weather card, we're first going to consult the sort of season weather tile here. And if the most recent three weather patterns matches one of the patterns shown on this card, we're going to do what it shows here at the bottom of that tile. So in this case, we'd advance the building track once. Here I would lose one food and here I would gain one production. But in this case, with only one weather card, there's no way for us to have a three weather pattern. So triggering the event as printed on that card, we're going to take event card number one, turn that over and read what it says. So it says, new locals. A sudden crashing sound booms across the town. At the source of the commotion is a pile of wood set aside for construction that has collapsed. Trapped underneath it is a panicked looking creator sprite. It cries out, help, I was only trying to tidy up the pile. The terrified sprite is carefully freed and gives thanks before embarrassingly scurrying back into the forest. Now it says read event two immediately. And unless it says otherwise on the card, as soon as an event has been read, it's removed from the game. So I'm gonna remove that from the game and read event card number two. So bringing back event card number two, it says a summit. The creator sprite that was freed from under the wood pile returns to town. He introduces himself as Punk and takes your group into the forest where there is a gathering of many unfamiliar sprites. You overhear them talking about your town, occasionally in a surly tone. Once they notice your presence, however, they scatter and hide in the greenery. Punk looks embarrassed and scurries away as well. How odd, perhaps they got shy? So now I'm gonna shuffle in events three and 146. And all that means is I'm gonna take those two cards, shuffle them up, and I'll put them back into that game tray that I showed you before for the next time that we draw a weather card that has that event symbol on it. So again, taking that tray, taking cards three and 146, mixing them up a bit without really paying too much attention, dropping them out into that slot. And now we go ahead and continue with the turn. So on every turn, each character, and I did just realize I forgot to take out the minis for the two characters, so let me go ahead and do that right now. So again, sorry for forgetting those before. Here we've got the minis. This is the ranger and this is the crafter. Placing those down and again, each character is going to do two things, primarily two things on their turn. And first, that means they're going to take an action in town somewhere. So right now there are a few locations that I can place out. I can place out here, 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 or here to take the action that it shows at that location. So first starting over here, this is the improve or discover land location. When I come here, I can either pay to increase resources over here on my resource tracker. And the cost of those resources is going to depend on the character that you're playing. 
So for the crafter, if I go to that location, I can buy as many resources as I want to, spending 15 for food, 10 for income, 10 for progress, or 5 for culture. Or I can choose to spend 5 coins to remove any one of these forest cards, basically, from the board. And the reason I'm going to want to do that is later on when we start building things, the buildings are going to, after they're built, fill in an empty slot that we've already removed the forest from. If we haven't cleared any land, we can't build any buildings. So continuing to talk about buildings, over here is our construct or demolish a building location. And coming here, I can always choose to destroy one building. Otherwise, I can choose to begin construction on a building. And at the start of the game, we have two buildings available to us. You can see here on these cards, this says longhouse. This is the sort of prerequisite that I need to have already in order to build this building. So these two both require the longhouse, which is the one building that we've already started the game with. And in order to construct a building, coming back to one of those cards, we need to spend, we're playing one to two characters, a number of resources as printed here. So here, one income, two progress, and one culture. To place this building in the building slot shown here. So this is building slot one. This would also be building slot one, spending a slightly different combination of resources. And that would get placed, as I said, into slot one when we construct that building. And then later on, on some of the weather cards, there is an icon that's the same here as if we get that pattern of icons that will then allow me to move every building I'm building up one space in that track. And when it moves up out of the top space, we're going to flip that building over and place it into one of the empty locations that we have. And when we flip the building over, we will get whatever it shows down here at the bottom of the card. In this case, either a food or a culture and an additional sprite die added to our tower. In this case, either income or progress and an additional villager added to our tower. And then it flips over and gets placed out onto the board where this now becomes a new location if it shows this blue icon here where I can place my character to take an action on later turns. And we're running out of space on the screen, so I'm going to set those off here to the side for now and I'll move them around. Actually, you know what, let me relocate this card, tray I mean, and then we can leave those two right there. So those are the two available buildings to us for right now at that location. Next location here is the tower, and at the tower I can spend two coins to take one die, or five coins to take two dice from that location. And these are going to be workers that allow us to get more stuff done on our player turn, which is the next thing that happens after this town action step. At the longhouse I can simply choose to take one coin, or I can buy one skill. And I'll talk a little bit more about the skills later when we get into the characters, but the skills are going to be ways for us to sort of add abilities or improve the abilities we have available to us in our character action later on in the turn. And the final space that we have available to us right now on the town is this space right here, and this is going on an adventure. And when we come here, we will simply be revealing the top adventure card under this tile here and reading and doing whatever that says. Now, I did just realize while I have this here, I didn't really talk about this goal card. And what this means is at the end of every season, we're going to check to see if this goal has been fulfilled. If it has, then we succeed and get something for it. And if it, we fail, then we're going to fail and get some kind of negative thing for it, generally negative thing for it, for failing. Also, if we pass, that goal is removed and occasionally we'll then be adding new goals in based on what it says on the back of the card. But if we do fail, that just gets shuffled back in and it's going to keep coming back out until we do manage to succeed. So during this season, I'm trying to focus on making sure that each of my characters has, sorry, not each of my characters because this is town related. I'm trying to make sure that my town has at least two culture at the end of the season. And right now we start with zero culture. So I'm trying to boost red. Again, that costs five for my crafter and 10 for my ranger. And then after a town action is performed, we're going to come back to the character's board and each character is going to be able to take a character action 
which is going to be different for every different kind of character in this game, and I'll explain that in just a minute, but they're going to take a character action that's associated with the color of the town action that they took previously. So you'll see the build action is orange villager connection or relation. The one over here where we're gaining resources is the blue spirit. This one here when we're recruiting workers is going to be the color of whatever die we've recruited. And if we've recruited both colors, we can choose. The longhouse you can see has a blue and orange split in the corner, which means that if I go there, I can choose which color to use. And the adventure space here, while it does show either or, is actually going to be determined by the result of the adventure that you went on, whether it's sprite aligned or villager aligned. So coming back to the characters, that's what we're going to be doing. Now the ranger is going to work a little bit strangely because you see here he has town and he has expedition. On a normal town turn, that's exactly what he'll do. He'll place out in the town, take a town action, come back and do a character action. But you'll see in just a minute when I explain how the ranger works, on a lot of the ranger's turns, they're actually going to be out on expedition, in which case we're gonna have this sort of tableau of cards along here that the ranger is walking along and that tableau of cards is gonna determine what he's doing. He's not actually gonna be going to the town every turn because very often he'll be out on expedition somewhere out there. And we'll talk about that in a second when I get into his character action or his sort of how to play section. But before I explain how the characters work and before I allow the characters to take a character action, I'm actually gonna play out this first town action step to start. And I'm sorry, I did just realize that my ranger never got his starting 10 coins. So I'll place out those 10 coins here. And there's a reason I'm doing that. I also just realized one more thing. Let me move these out of the way a little bit more. So I am going to need the space. The other thing that I forgot is that the ranger does start with an initial set of cards in his stock area. And he is going to be starting with one compass, one axe, one trap, and one rifle like that. And I'll explain what that means in a minute, but this is going to be his starting stock. These are the th goods that he has available to him, or in this case, the tools that he has available to him. But let me go ahead and take that town action. The reason I remembered that he didn't have any money is that I'm going to send them to the tower, spending five coins to take both of those dice like that. And I know that we need to culture by the end of the game, sorry, of the end of the season, so I'm actually gonna send her there as well to buy one culture, just one for now, spending five coins. If I wanna buy one later, she still has the five coins left to do so, but I wanna hold on to the money in case I need it for something else at the moment. And that means for her, she's now aligned in blue or spirit. And that means for him, I can choose whichever alignment I would like to choose. So then starting with the crafter, the way that the crafter is going to work is based on her alignment, she's going to be choosing one of the actions as printed here on the board. And basically all this means is if I've taken a spirit action, I can select from the top three materials. If I've taken a villager action, I can select from the bottom three materials and I can choose to either add one of the chosen material to my bag or sell one of the chosen material from somewhere in my materials track. And the way that that's going to work is you can see that what I get for selling the stuff is going to be based on where it is at that time in this board. So if I sell something from here, I don't make any money, but I get to draw one more request from my request deck. Here I would get one coin for the good and I would be able to move one good forward one space in this progression. Here I would get one coin and be allowed to draw one more good from my bag, placing it here in the sort of available supply. Here I would get two coins and be able to sell something else. And here I would get three coins and be able to upgrade my sort of price of each item, or realistically, according to the rules, the reputation I have for that kind of good or item that I'm making. So basically, if I'm doing well at making a specific kind of item, then I can boost how much I'm earning sort of as a core base value for that kind of item when it's sold. And then after I choose one of those 
items to either add to my bag or sell, I will then sort of go through the normal core loop of the crafter. And that's going to be, from my bag, I will be drawing three materials. So before I do that, let me sort of show you how it's done as I walk through everything. First things first, basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to match these requests. So somebody wants me to make them a bag. And in order to make a bag, I need to have these two materials here, as well as this one right here. And if I get those three things, meaning two level two canvas materials and one level one birch material, I can trade them in at the end of my turn to earn two coins plus whatever my reputation is for bags. And then in this case, I will get to in, in, advance the level of one more material that I have in my tray. And again, starting at the beginning, everything is the sort of lowest reputation. So I will get five coins as my base. So two plus five would be seven coins if I can make that. And I did take a blue action, which means I could add red or green. And I don't have any of either of them there. So I'm going to add a green because I need two of them. So that's my normal action based on the sprite. And then from my bag, I'm going to draw three of these tokens at random. And you see here that I got two greens and one orange or two canvas and one paper. And what I do then is I'm going to place them here in this first sort of available slot. And then for each item in this slot, I can choose to either simply place it in this first slot here automatically, or I can put one of a color back into my bag to move another material of that same type one space forward in my box. So for example, I can put this paper here and then return this paper back to the bag to move this one forward one. And I'm going to do the same thing with green, putting this one here, returning this green or canvas back to the bag. And then finally, all I have here is one leather or purple good left. So I'm just going to put that there. And that is the end of her character action. And she should have come back to take care of that. One more thing though I should point out while I'm talking about this is though, you see these slots right here. And these slots right here are where skills are going to be placed as I play throughout the game and as I sort of unlock those skills. And in order to do that, or sorry, in order to use those skills, basically whichever of these, these rows I pick as my character action, if there is a skill in the slot that I've chosen, I will then also activate that skill. And there are three different levels of skills and level two and level three will actually not be usable until later on in the game when something I'm not going to mention happens. Right now, the only skills available to me are my level one skills. So let me sort of explain what they are. Her four level one skills are loyalty, working fast, more experience, and productive. And in order for her to get those, she's going to have to spend whatever the resources shown are on that skill when she goes to the longhouse and takes that add one skill action. So let me show you what those four skills are going to be doing. First here, loyalty. Loyalty is going to allow her to Spend one coin to raise the value of any spirit, sorry, sprite or villager die that she has in her available sort of pool of dice. Working fast is simply going to allow her to advance one material of any type forward on her tray. More experience is going to allow her to add an additional material of any type into her bag. And finally, productive is going to allow her to draw one material at random from the bag. So again, at any point, if she wants to take the town action coming to the longhouse, spending the resources shown on one of those tiles to place out that tile into her skill area. In addition, you will see these sort of dice shaped slots here, here and here on her board. And that's what we're going to be using those sprite and worker or villager dice for. And basically, in order to do that, if she had any available to her, she would tick them down one value and put it in that slot. Placing a die in any of these will, just like her action, allow her to either add a material or sell a material of that type. Placing here, showing that arrow, will allow her to advance one material in that sort of path. 
and placing one here will allow her to add, or sorry, draw one additional material from her bag, placing it there. Now, the worker actions do happen after her character action, so if I draw something from a bag and place it there, it won't be able to be moved until the following turn. Now, for the ranger, again, most of the time he's going to be spending his time on expedition, and I'll show you how that works in the next turn, but I wanted first to sort of boost him up a little by getting him some dice, because those might be useful on his first expedition. But also I wanted to finish explaining sort of the boards and the character actions and town actions so that I could show you how those work. So he's going to come back and because he took blue and orange, he can choose to take any of the actions here. And his actions are very simply going to allow him to take new tools into his stock area. So if he takes a sprite action, he can take an axe, a compass, or these sort of footprints into his tool action. Otherwise, if he takes a villager action, he can take a backpack, a target, sorry, a rifle or a trap into his available tools in stock. But also, after doing that, he's going to be able to trigger one of the actions associated with whatever thing he sort of chose on the board. So if he chose the axe, he can sell wood for two coins each or use two wood to increase the sort of build speed of a building by one, moving it up on the building track. For the compass action, he can sell maps for five coins each or use a map to flip over one of the level one expedition cards. And I'll show you what that means in just a second, but that will sort of give me some information about what's coming up in a future expedition. If he uses either the footprints or the backpack, he can use his sprite dice to take a building action somewhere on the main town board or he can increase his sort of inventory level, his available inventory level, which is this track up here. And in order to do that, he'd have to take this action and then spend whatever it shows under the next space. So in the next space here, I'd have to spend five coins and one meat to move up here. But that increases my inventory from four to five. And I'll explain what that inventory means just a minute when we go on our first expedition. Next in the Rifle area, we can sell meat for three coins each, or I can discard one rifle to flip over the top card of the level one expedition deck. And for every meat that's shown on that card, I will gain one meat. And then finally, for the trap, I can sell these furs or pelts for four coins each, or I can spend one of those plus one of any tool to take two of any tools. So right now, I am going to, since I don't have either footsteps or backpack, choose one of those and I will say I took the backpack, I'm placing that right there. And that means that I can either use a, a die to take a building action or I could improve here. But since I don't have any goods yet, I don't have any meat, I don't have any pelts, I don't have any maps, I don't have any of any of these goods yet, I can't really do any of this stuff. I could use one of these dice to take a building action, but the only building action right now is a longhouse, and I don't have enough to get skills, so that would just be taking one coin, and it's not really worth one die for one coin because they cost two to take. Then, looking at his skills, again, level two and level three skills are not available to me. So looking specifically at his level one skills, we start here with loyalty, and you can see here that his skills are going to cost some combination of money and goods that he collects while on expedition. So for five coins and one pelt, we can get this skill, which allows me to spend one coin to increase the value of either a sprite die or a villager die. Here, community builder, five coins and a map will give me the ability to, while on expedition, place a blue sprite die or use the value of a blue sprite die to take one building action, which, which allows him to take town actions even when he's on expedition, which is something he normally can't do. Next, extra work for five coins and wood will allow him again to flip over one level one expedition card. And finally, the delegator for five coins and one meat will do the same thing as the other one except now using a villager die to take a building action while he's on an expedition. So again, I'm going to set those down here. And that is the end of our first turn. So then, continuing on as normal, the next step is going to be drawing our next weather card, which right now is 
this rain card and it shows an event again. So we're going to read our next event. And that is sun and rain. Again, there's no pattern yet coming out. So we draw our next event at random, which looks to be card number 146. And it says, called to the valley, an elderly man rides into town on his rickety mule-drawn cart on an otherwise unremarkable day. He stops in the middle of town and begins to unload. When questioned of his intentions, he, bas he simply smiles and says, I've been called here by our creator to be with you wonderful people. All on his own, he begins to build. It says, place the chapel on the fourth space of the construction crew. So we're going to take the chapel. This is a building that I wouldn't have been able to build myself. It only comes out of this story. And you can see that's actually printed on the card saying that here it is an event card building and I am placing it in slot four as the event just told me to. So that goes right there. But that means that I need to make some space for that in my town so that that can move up and eventually get built into town. So that is something I should sort of prioritize. Then taking town actions, why not do that right now, actually? She's going to go there, spending five coins, one, two, three, four, five, to dig up a forest. And I don't really care where we put the chapel. Let's put the chapel out here by the waterfall. And when you make space in a forest like this, you're going to turn over the card and do whatever it shows. And now this card is actually a mistake in the printing of this game. This symbol is actually supposed to be that green symbol like this that is advancing the building queue. So this is simply going to move up one and that card goes back to the box. And then he's actually not going to take a town action. This time we're going to go on expedition. So let me explain to you now how expeditions work. When you go on an expedition, you're going to be using this expedition length sort of card to choose the type of expedition you're going to go on. So just for now, to show you a simple one, I'm going on a light expedition which says that I should have one, sorry, two level one expedition cards and one level two expedition card. So from my decks here, I'm going to take two level ones and one level two, and I'll shuffle those up. And you'll see that if I had used any of those ones that flip a card over to the other side, during this selection process, I might accidentally or randomly draw a card that has already been flipped over so I can see what it is so I can prepare a little better for the expedition. But what's going to happen is I'm now going to place out these three expedition cards here and make a little bit more space for them like that. And this is the expedition he will be going on and he starts in the first location. And then when you're planning for an expedition, you're going to bring a number of tools with you equal to whatever your inventory level is, which right now for me is a level four. So I get to bring four of these cards with me on my expedition. And you'll see in the bottom corner here, there's a rifle here, there's a trap and here, there's another trap. This is going to give me some kind of idea of what might be showing up along the way, what kinds of things I might have to deal with, what kinds of tools I might need along the way. So I will definitely be bringing a rifle. I will definitely be bringing a trap and I'm allowed to bring two more things. I might as well bring my ax in case I can chop down some wood and my compass in case I can sort of track some trails and make a map. And the order of these cards is going to matter, but right now I don't really know what that order should be. Basically, I'm trying to predict the order of things that are going to happen on an expedition card. And right now, me trying to explain that to you isn't going to mean anything until I show it to you. So that's what's going to happen right now, because when you go on an expedition, you're instantly going to flip over the first location. And this first location says, watch for danger. So first things first, I'm going to check the weather for the day. If it matches, that's going to happen. And it does match, which unfortunately for me is a bad thing because this says I'm going to lose one of my goods in my inventory that I have with me. Then we're going to take a look at these columns one by one, left to right. And anything that has a brown dot on it when we get to that column is going to automatically be triggered if we have that item in that spot. So if I had in my second position in my inventory an ax, I would instantly be able to get one more rifle card, adding it to the end of the line of my inventory. 
Otherwise, these checks and these X's are going to be given to us if we do or do not spend that good or that tool. So for example, here, if I discard a rifle, I will get a meat. If I don't discard a rifle, I will get attacked. Here, if I discard an ax, I will get some wood. And here, if I discard a rifle, I will be able to trade two of the things in my inventory for one of any tool from the supply. And if I don't discard a rifle, I'm going to have to add one more level one expedition card to the end of this expedition. So first things first, it is raining, which means I have to discard a good of my choice from this row. I don't want to get rid of this axe because I need it. I don't want to get rid of this tool because they both call for tools. So I'm going to get rid of this compass. Uh, hold on. Yes. Which is sad, but... It is what it is. Next, rifle. If I spend a, discard a rifle, I can get a food. In the case that the thing is becoming the thing on the other side of this card, meaning on the back of the rifle card is the food, I don't actually discard it, I simply flip it over to become that thing. So by doing that, I've gotten a food, and because I activated that, I don't get attacked. Now if I choose to, I can turn this axe into some wood, and I think, yes, I will do that. So that's that. Then we move to the third column. If I spend a rifle, I will get the ability to throw away two items to get a new tool, which I can't do and I don't want to anyway, which means because I didn't do that, I have to add one more level one card to my expedition. So making a little bit more space, just because things are a little cramped here. Whoops, don't want to look at that. So I'm actually going to do that again. Drawing that one like that. And that is the end of his town and character action. That is all he, that he gets to do on his turn. So she will come back to her board to take her character action. Again, I'm looking for two green and a red. She took a blue action. And I already have a green there, but I would like more green. There is a red in here, and I only need a level one red. So I'm going to take a green, put that in there, shuffle them up. Drawing three tiles. I got a green, a blue, and a purple. So I do need two greens, but I need that to be level two. So I'm going to drop that back in and move that to level two. I'm going to put the blue in there because that's all I can do. And the purple, yeah, I might as well. I'm going to upgrade that purple to a level two like that. She has no workers available to her, so that is the end of the turn. Next turn, drawing out our next weather card is a sunny day. Nothing marked here, so that's not triggering anything. And then looking here, sun, rain, sun does not trigger any patterns on there. So back to town action. Now, he is on an expedition, so he doesn't take a town action. He simply moves to the next card in his expedition. And she is going to... Yeah, let's go on an adventure so you can see how that works. And drawing one at random, we've got this right here. A meow from above. Sudden pitiful cry from above startles you on your walk. Peering into the branches, you spy what looks a little calico who's gotten herself into trouble. She's too high and doesn't know how to get down. The cat has drawn the attention of a small crowd of wood golems who look on with trepidation. What should we do? They ask. You've got two choices here. A, I can enlist the wood golems' aid. They're small, but surely they know how to scale a tree. Or B, I can climb the tree and rescue the cat myself. Now, I, in my previous play, I did do lots of siding with the sprites on everything kind of choices. So I am going to take B and climb the tree and rescue the cat myself. So first off, if it's rainy, subtract one from the result of the roll. Huh? What roll? We didn't roll yet. B, climbing the tree is not too difficult. Getting the cat down is another problem. It turns out you need the sprites help anyway. So roll all of the blue dice at the tower. I don't have any, because there's only one and the ranger has it with them. So if any of the results are equal to three, they help me bring them down. If it's successful, I increase the value of all dice, all sprite dice at the tower. There aren't any dice, nothing happens. That goes away, ah, but sorry. This is marked orange, so I am going to be able to take an orange villager character action right now on my turn. So coming back here, she gets to take an orange action, which could be green again. So my bag's being very, very green. Let's take a look at some 
skills. I like to do the working fast one, which lets me move things up my track faster. But that takes a lot. Three blue, two purple, one orange, one red. Let's see what else. We've got a three purple in there coming anyway. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to aim for that because I've got a two purple already. I've got a blue at one. One orange and one red is not that hard to do. So I want to put a blue in my bag. Drawing three tiles. I've got a blue, a purple, and a green. Now, I need greens at level two. It already is. So I'm going to slot that green in new. For this, I need a blue at level three. So I'm going to put that blue back to move that up one. And then the purple, I don't need that to go up any higher for working fast. So I'm going to slot that in the first slot like that. He goes on expedition. This flips over. Cloudy. It's not cloudy, so that does not happen. First things first. If I have a trap in the first space, I get meat. I don't. But I can spend this trap to get a hide or fur. I don't know that I want to, though, because I see another one of those is coming up here. And I'm worried that there might be one that's like, get attacked if you don't have it. So I'm going to hold off on that. I don't have a compass, which means when I don't have something, I get to look ahead here because this symbol means look at the next card. So by not using that compass, I actually get to see what's coming up next, which is great. I'm going to need a sprite die, a trap, and a compass, but there is no attack happening, so that's okay. Then this last one says, if I use one sprite die, I will get a compass. If I don't, I'm going to lose something. Well, that's partially why I went to the village at the beginning to use that sprite die. So I'm going to take that and tick it down one value, which gets me one compass card, which puts that at the end of my inventory. And that means I don't get hurt by that card. This moves on. Now, because this is a zero, it gets re-rolled and placed back at the tower showing something. So there's a die like that. That's the end of the turn, and he will start here on the next turn. Drawing another weather card. We've got Cloudy, and this does show the building progression icon, so that gets placed there. Before I do anything, though, Rain, Sun, Cloud, Rain, Sun, Cloud, tells me I get to get one more production there, which is great. Then, this building moves forward one. And she takes a town action. I don't really care what I get right now, so I'm actually going to go on another adventure. And this adventure card says, Exploring the ruins. The ruins of an old collapsed building sit at the base of the mountain. There's no telling how deep it goes, but today you're going to explore it. It's a big job. You probably shouldn't do it alone. You may pay two to recruit a villager or a sprite. Or if I already have them, I can decrease them to have them come with me. But I don't have any money, and I don't have any of them, so let's see what happens. So then it says, total the number of villagers and sprites helping, which right now is zero because I don't have anything. It says, you are unharmed but find nothing valuable. You cannot perform your character action this day. Ouch. That's a shame because I was really hoping we might get to this this day, but that's okay. She comes home and rests from the adventure she just went on, and he is now at the next location. I don't have any sprite dice left because, whoops, it ran out and it went there. Ah, before I do that, I see clouds. Clouds say that I can rearrange the order of these cards, which is gonna be kind of silly, but we'll see what happens. All right, so what's gonna happen is this. I'm not going to rearrange from the clouds because I don't have a sprite, I'm skipping that. I do have a trap. And it says, if the trap is in the second location, I can also rearrange these things. But I don't really need to. I will then use that as it shows to get furs. Now for the compass, it says, if the compass is in the third spot, and or if I use or discard the compass, I can basically split off a second path. So I would draw another card matching whatever's there, or cards matching whatever's there and create sort of a split path that I can choose to take other, either of, and whichever one I don't take goes back to the deck. I don't really have any need to waste that to do that, especially because that card requires the compass, and there's no real reason for me to go to a different path, so I'm just gonna leave that as is, 
and move there for the start of my next turn. So then moving to the next turn, we draw another weather card, which again is cloudy and does show an event. So we're going to have an event this turn, but let's check the weather patterns. There is no pattern that is sun, cloud, cloud. So then drawing the event card, we've got card number three about the tribes. It says, Fix greets your group and apologizes for the confusion with Punk in the forest. He got overly keen. We sprites are secretive and don't warm to outsiders easily. Fix taps herself on the chest. Well, not all of us. Sorry for not warning you. She then explains that there are six sprite tribes of whom some have uncertainties about humans being here. Fix suggests you find a way to show them your good intentions. Shuffle in event four through seven. So again from the box, I'll take out four, five, six, and seven, shuffling those up and placing them back in that event slot of my tray. Now she takes an action again. I don't have any money. I could go here for a coin, but that's not really worth it. I'm going on an adventure again. Let's, let's do it. Let's hope that this one works out better than the last time. This time my adventure is Sunken Cave. It says, lounging by the seaside, you spot a grotto partially submerged in a tide. Exploring it, you see a scattered pile of goods. Looks like someone's pack washed up here. There's also a submerged tunnel nearby. You could swim it, but the tide is rising. So I can say, A, search the goods and leave with your findings before the tide comes, or push your luck and swim into the submerged tunnel. I don't like my luck, especially since I just got hurt, and I don't have any way to be helped if I need it. So we're going to take A. A says, you find some goodies and escape well ahead of the tide. Gain three coins. So that's good. I don't mind getting some money. So she gets three coins and comes home to take an orange action based on that card. I really want to push up that green, so I'm putting another green in. No, hold on. Yeah, maybe so, just in case. But for that working fast, I need a three blue, which I've got a two. I need a two purple, which I have. I need a one orange, I've got a two, and I need a red, but I need a red for this one too. All right, so drawing three, one, two, three. I've got two greens and an orange. Yuck. All right, well, first off, one green goes in here to push up that green. Now, you'll see here now I've got one, two, three, four, five tiles in this location. Five is the max that can ever fit in there. So I can't really do anything, but I will then use this orange to push this orange up. It's not really going to be meaningful because if I get that skill, then that orange only needed to be a one and now it's a two. Ah, yeah, you know what? Let's not do that. I'm going to put that orange there instead. And this green also goes in there like that. That's the end of her turn. He goes on his final step of the expedition, flipping that card. Sunny, it's not. If I want to spend a compass, I can get a map. Yes. If I have a bag in the second slot, I get a map. I don't. I could spend a bag to cycle cards from here and switch them out with things from my stock, but I don't have a bag. If I had a rifle, I could get a meat. Uh-oh. Not having a rifle means I'm going to lose something. And right now, looking at this, I want the meat for my next inventory upgrade. I see that furs are worth four, maps are worth five, and wood is worth two. I'm going to get rid of that wood. So I lose my wood. Now we come back from expedition. These come back to me. So now I have these three items available to me. If I'd had any tools left over, they would have come back too, but I don't, unfortunately. And then all of these cards go back into their piles in preparation for future expeditions. And that is the end of his turn. Drawing my next weather card, I've got Sunny. And that's Sunny with a building advancement. Cloud, cloud, sun means nothing in this season. This advances once. Then, nobody has enough of anything, really. I like that sprite for him so that he can have them when he goes on expedition. I'm going there and spending two coins to take that sprite. Which means he's going to come home and do a blue action. So I'll just set him there to remember that. And she, again, has nothing to do, so I'm going on another adventure. 
At least that means you get to see lots of adventures. That's cool, huh? And the adventure this time says, The Long Way Round. After a pleasant day wandering, you try a new path home through a rocky river ravine, only to find it has been cut off by stonefall. Rock golems are working diligently to clear it, but they won't be finished anytime soon. You may need to take an alternate route home. So it says, A, I can take an old walking path that winds its way up and along the cliffside, grab a walking stick and hike it, or I can wait for the rock golems to finish their work, then continue on the original path. I'm going to try the alternate path and see what happens. So A, the walk is a labor, leaving you parched and exhausted. However, you spot what looks like a scattering of raw gems. Roll all orange and gain as many coins as the orange. Well, guess what? There aren't any, so I get zero coins. Again, sad. We need more workers. <laughs> but I have to recruit them into our village. All right, so she comes back home and gets an orange action, which is a shame because I really want red, but I need blue to move up to level three, so I'm gonna place a blue in the bag and hope that I can draw one, but I really wanna draw red, please, come on. Of course not, two blue and a green, all right. Well then, I'm gonna use one blue to push that blue up to level three. And then I'm going to place one more blue there and use this green back to the bag to move that green up to level two like that. That's her turn. His turn. He is taking a blue character action means axe, compass, or feet. And I'm going to take, huh, I'm going to take the boots because... Uh, how much money? He doesn't have enough money. No, I'm not. I want to sell the map. So I'm going to take a map. Sorry, a compass so that I can sell my map for five coins. Like that. Next weather event is raining, but our building queue is going to increase again. Cloud, sun, rain does nothing here, but this now gets to flip over and seeing what it shows here, I'm going to get one food and one sprite added to the tower. That flips over and gets placed here. Now, let me show you this card. The chapel says at the end of the season, which is what that means, I'm going to get one culture resource. Yay. But for right now, I get one food. And I get one sprite die from the box added at our tower. So we're going to roll that and place that. Ooh, that's a three sprite. I like it. In that case, she is going to go there. Spending two coins to take that sprite. So she's going to be taking a blue character action, but before we do that, let him take his town action. I need to fill up this stock so I have the ability to go on another expedition. But for right now, I'm going to do another adventure, and I'll show you why in just a second. And the adventure this time is Into the Unknown, and it says, I get to choose one, roll an orange or roll a blue die says, if there is no dice at the tower, nothing happens on my adventure. Well, that's a shame. So then it says, once I've completed this adventure, shuffle it back into the adventure deck. So that was a basically a nothing turn. So shuffle that back into my adventure deck. And that basically means I get to choose whatever color I want to this time, which is fine. But anyway, I sort of have my choice made for me because I am going to take the feet because I want to upgrade my inventory and right now I need to spend five coins and one food so losing five coins returning one food over here means I can now upgrade to an inventory of five cards so when I go on expedition next time I will be bringing five cards with me and I'm going to make use of these dice because they're not doing any good sitting here so I will tick this orange one down like this to take one rifle and I will take the blue one down like that to take one axe. And then the orange one is done, so it gets re-rolled back to the tower. One is not great. And she's going to take her blue action, which is going to be adding a red, because I really need a red for this to come out. So drawing from the bag, 
One, two, three. Yay, a red. The red's going to go right there in the first position. Green might as well. Uh-uh. It's getting crowded. I want to spend a green because I have three green in here to push one green up to level three. I don't need it, but I'm going to for now. And blue. I might as well push up this blue in case something good comes out later like that. And that's one, two, three, four, five, which is fine. Okay, then it is the end of my turn. I do have two level two greens. Uh, hold on, before I do that, I could use this sprite, but no, I'm not going to right now. I do have two level two greens and one level one red. So I'm going to return those to the supply to build a bag. And I'm going to get two plus star again. Looking here says five coins. So she's going to get seven coins for selling that bag. Like that. And then I get to advance one thing for free. And looking at working fast, I need a three blue, a two purple, one orange, and one red. So it doesn't really say that I need to do anything. I'm going to push up one more blue like that. Now, this card gets turned over and sort of added to my available completed requests because in order to upgrade my reputation in any one item, I need to spend a card of that good type when I trigger the upgrade or increase reputation action. So, for example, right now the bag says one for five coins. That one is the number of completed bag requests that I need to discard in order to upgrade that. So if I can take one of these star reputation actions and discard this one completed bag card, I can increase my bag reputation to the next level. And we'll see if I can get there, but not right now, because I need to get something up here in order to trigger that effect. So drawing my next weather card, we've got a cloudy day that does trigger an event. And I've got sun, rain, cloud, does nothing. So drawing my event card, we've got event number six, which says the fairies. Fairies aren't as reclusive as other sprites because they can fly. They live high up amidst the treetops. Getting up there is going to take some special climbing equipment, equipment that must be built from scratch. As your group climbs, the fairies flit around laughing and encouraging you. By the time you reach the top, you expect to find the fairies impressed by your efforts, but instead they're nowhere to be seen. So I'm going to increase the value of one die at the tower, which is this villager right here. So he goes to a two. And then coming back to that event card, it says, if culture is my highest resource, I'm going to shuffle in event 50, otherwise shuffle in event 51. And then it says set this card aside. When you've resolved events four to seven, shuffle in event eight. So I'm going to put that right there. Looking at my culture, According to the rules, highest means that if there's a tie, it is also considered highest. So my culture is one of the highest resources. So I will be shuffling in event 50. And then I have to, again, leave that there until four through seven events have been completed. Then she's going to go here because she's going to spend five coins to increase the culture to two so that we can complete our goal. The goal remembering says culture must be two or higher. So I'm going to mark that goal as completed. And he's somewhat flexible. I only have four cards, so he's not going to go on expedition because, well, four cards isn't going to do any good for me on a five inventory. So I'm going to go on an adventure one more time. And this time the adventure says hunting mishap. You've been tracking a prized buck. It's taken hours to get to this point, but the opportunity to line up your shot arrives as the stag grazes in the field. Suddenly you receive a blow to the back of your head and everything goes black. When you come to, the first thing you notice is the splitting headache you have. The second are the unusually large bare footprints nearby. Evidently someone snuck up behind you, although they didn't take anything. There's no sign of the buck. It says shuffle event 125 into the deck. We did get a spirit, or sorry, I keep doing that, sprite action. And again, I'm shuffling event 125 into the deck. So then coming back here, I get to take a sprite action for her and I'm going to sell. Uh, no, 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 no. I need red for my thing. I'm going to put red back into the bag. Drawing three. One, two, three. Yay, double red. Okay. 
So then I'm going to place a red there. I'm going to place another red there. And it doesn't mean anything, but I've got two blues at level three, so I'll drop a blue to move that to level four. And now I'm all set for next time to get that skill. I'm not, again, not going to use my sprite. It might be a waste, but I don't need it for anything right now. Then the ranger is going to come back, and he's also getting a blue action. I've got an axe, I've got a compass, I've got feet. So it doesn't matter which of those I get really, but I am going to take an axe again. And I want to keep that for my expedition, so I'm not using that. So that's his turn. Drawing another weather card. This is the last weather card of the season, which means this is our last turn of the season. It is raining. No trigger there. Rain cloud, rain triggers nothing. So we're simply going into our final actions of this season. So she is going to... What do we need for building? Two orange, a blue, and a purple, an orange, two blue, and a red. Yeah, we don't have anywhere near the stuff we need to build, unfortunately. So she's going to go on an adventure, because why not? And he's going to go on an expedition. I'll do this time a short expedition. So we're going to shuffle in one level one and two level twos. So one level one. And two level twos. Again, shuffling those, laying them out. And then building our inventory, we get five cards. I see feet, I see axe, I see trap. I don't have any traps, which is sad. But I will take the feet. I will take an axe. And I will take a compass. And I get two more, so let's do a rifle and a backpack like that. This one is not going. And we'll turn over the first expedition card. It is raining, means ha, we get to add in one more level one location. I'm just gonna slide it in like that for right now. Then, first things first, if you have a trap in the first place, get a foot, I don't. You can spend a trap to get fur, I don't have a trap. Next thing, if I want to use feet, I can split to a different pathway. I don't really care to do that right now. Then finally, I can use my sprite to look ahead one and to exchange things if I need to. So let's look ahead one. Because I can see that. Oh, I could lose. I'm going to get, right now I get to exchange between here and here. If I don't use the axe though, I get to rearrange things and then use the axe there. So realistically, I don't need to swap. Yeah, two axes would be nice to have. All right, so I am gonna use that, knocking it down to a zero, which means I get to look ahead. I already did that anyway. Ah, did I already knock that down one? Yeah, I think I did. All right, so that should have been placed there, sorry. Then this means I get to swap things between my inventory and my stock. So I'm actually going to swap out that backpack to place in another axe because I see the next one. I kind of want to have two axes, even though I'm not really going to be able to use both of them this time. It's nice to have it there. This comes back here. He moves to the next one for the next turn, but that's the end of the season. So you won't get to see the next turn because again, in the next season, I'm going to be swapping characters, but let me show you what happens at the end of a season. So then step one, at the end of the season, we're going to look for anything that has this little calendar icon on it and do what it says. So because I have a chapel, I will be getting one more culture. Then we're going to resolve our goal for that season, which we did complete. So I'm going to take that card, flip it over to the other side and see what happens. And because we succeeded, we're going to check the place with the check mark. I'm gaining in a food and I'm shuffling in goal 13. So my food increases by one. That goal gets removed from the game. I'm going to then add in goal 13 to the rest of my goals. And then at the end of every season like this, once we've resolved our goal, I'm going to shuffle the goals, select two of them or choose two of them at random. And then from those two, choose the goal that I'd like to use for my next season. So I've got work of art that says the total value of sprites at the tower must be 10 or higher. I only have two sprites, so the best I can do is six. That's pretty hard right now. 
The other one says, large, harvest food must be two or higher. Food is already two, so as long as I can keep it there or make it better, that's the one I want. So we're going to reset. That's my goal for next season. Then all of these get shuffled back up. And placed back into our tray. And the season is going to then move to the next season. So going from spring into summer like that. And that is the end of the season. And I am going to pause here and stop because this is actually a good pausing time for me recording as well as in the game because what I'd like to show you here, which is going to be important for this game, is how easy it is to sort of save everything moving forward to the next turn. Now, let me move this out of the way for a second. I'm going to begin by saving my characters. And because I won't be using the characters the next time we play, it would be a really bad idea for me to keep these dice here because then no one could ever use them again. So the first thing you're going to do when switching to a new character is return all of the dice back to the tower. Everything else though is going to stay with that character. So we need to reset everything here. And I just realized I made a mistake. I didn't want to send her there. I wanted to send her there to get this skill, but I didn't get a chance to show you that. So I will prioritize getting a skill for the farmer or the merchant in my next season. In any case, all of the unclaimed skills go back into this section of her board like this. That cover goes back on top there. Next in here, we will place all of the requests as needed into that slot. And this fulfill request card I'm going to place in face up to remember next time I play the game that is fulfilled. All of my coins that I have go in there. Any of the resources that I'm not using are going to simply go back into their stacks in the box like this. Covering that up with our board again. And then finally for this area here, what's going to happen is if I take that off, you can see that all of these have a large sort of wide trough in them. So we're simply going to turn all of those to the side like that so that they are covered by the lid. That goes there. Her materials that are in the bag stay in the bag for the next time she plays. And the lid simply gets placed on there, clipping everything in, holding everything very nicely. Nothing can move around. And that goes back to the box. Next, same thing for the ranger. Opening up all of our compartments like that. His coins are going to go there. His skills will all get placed inside here like that. All of the unused cards from over here are going to get stacked up and placed in this first location right there. Same thing, all of the unused expedition cards are going to be collected and placed in this top right corner right here with that expedition tile placed on top. Everything from the stock means this backpack and this fur will get placed in there. And then since this expedition card has already been finished, we can actually return that back to the unused supply area because he only needs to finish those. So what you're going to do is place the leftmost card here at the bottom and then stack these in order on top of them because order does matter. Same thing here, the leftmost card here gets stacked on the bottom with each one subsequently placed on top like that. Putting this back on the top, slicking that right back there. And again, placing that lid on there and the ranger again, all held very nice and snug is all saved for another play. Then finally to clean up the board, removing the miniatures to put back into the box, everything else can go into this tray here. So you'll see there's a divider here for the dice that can move back and forth. These are the dice that I don't have available to me yet in my game. And all of the dice that I do have available to me get placed into these slots over here like that. The board itself stays exactly as is, but what I want to do here is 
I've got this event card that's still going, so I'm going to stick that in there. The buildings can go back into the main box where the buildings go, but I always like to have the buildings that are sort of available to be built to me on hand. So I'm going to stick those in there. And likewise, the season tile for winter and fall, I like to keep handy as well, can go right in there. And then finally, these three boards can just stack up like this, keeping all of the cards and all of the tokens and all of the tiles in place. That gets laid in here like that. And finally, on top of that, we place its lid. And again, that holds everything very nicely in there. You do get a little bit of sliding around of the cards, but they all settle back into where they belong. That is saved for our next play. So for the next play, I will be coming back, continuing to season two, the summer, using the farmer and the merchant. And at that point, I can show you how everything unpacks and plays back out again. All right, then before I set back up for the next season, I want to just say right here, I'm sorry for any sort of color change or brightness change or anything else. This is another day that I'm recording this second piece. And the, I changed the settings of the camera a little bit as this is a new camera and I've been playing with things a little bit along the way. But I have done my best to sort of edit to match the coloring. It's not going to be perfect. Just wanted to put that out there. So let's go ahead and set up for the new season. So undoing all of the stuff that I did to save the game, I'm going to take out that town board game tray and place out those again onto the table in the row as before. And you'll see that everything is the way that it was in the last season. So all of our resources are already out there. All of the buildings that we've built are already out there. The season is on summer now. We've already got our quest set up. The weather deck is here. And everything we need is all right there to go. So I'm going to set this off to the side for right now. Uh, sorry, before I do that, I also need to place these dice back out. So those are our available dice at the tower. And also, I don't need that, so I'll remove that. But we also need to place out the buildings that we have available to us. Just because I had them out here on the side last time and it's nice to have them on screen again so we can see what's coming up or what's available to us. And then for the playthrough for the second season, I will be using the other two characters. So starting first by taking out the farmer tray. And then setting the farmer up for a first play. Again, I have played with all of these characters before, so they have sort of been reset back to their original status. Pulling off all of the top things, and actually, apparently I didn't because there's a coin in here I shouldn't have. But I'll keep it because the farmer, just like everyone else, starts with 10 coins. So I'll place those out and then continue setting up the farmer. There's nothing under there. That's just a slot for that tile. So step one, as with every character, was to take out the 10 coins. I'm going to set the farmer's skills over here as well. And then it's a little bit of a mess. I'll try and clean things up in a minute. But over here, there are several types of tokens, which I hope you can see are the livestock tokens, these cows here, and these sort of different tools and technologies the farmer can add to his farm to give himself a variety of different abilities. So I'm just going to take all of those out for right now and I'll find a good home for them in just a minute. But just to empty that so we have it available to us. And then these are all of the crops the farmer has access to. Just like the crafter, the farmer also has a bag. So I'm going to take all of the crops that the farmer has and throw them into this bag. Like that. And doing that, this sort of area is done. So I'm going to flip over the board just like we did before, showing the prices of all of the different resources like we saw on the other character boards. And then this information is going to relate to the crops of the farmer in just a second. So let me go ahead and finish setting up for the farmer. From the bag of crops that I just set up, I'm going to draw four at random, placing them out here with the ungrown or sort of the freshly planted side you can see if you look carefully, this side's got strawberries, this side has nothing yet. So we're going to place them out with the ungrown side face up like that. 
Now it looks like we got somewhat lucky because we got a whole lot of strawberries coming out. This one here you can see is potatoes. That's the grown side and that's the just planted side. So placing them all with the just planted side there. Now the book does say it doesn't matter which side of the tokens is face up, but when they go into our sort of farm area or garden area, we're going to be placing them in that sort of untended, just planted side. So it's easier just to have them placed that way on the board. And then finally to set up the farmland area, we're going to be placing out this untamed land tokens. And there are a variety of different untamed locus, sorry, untamed land tokens. And they can be placed anywhere I'd like to in this area. And basically what those are going to be are they're going to be spots that can't be planted with crops until they've been cleared out and space has been made. So they can be placed anywhere we'd like to except that they can't be adjacent to each other. But it's also worth trying to make as much of a sort of empty space as possible to fit in all of the stuff that we will be planting later. So let me go ahead and place those out somewhat randomly. So long as they're not adjacent to each other, everything is okay. All right. Placing out a few more like this and like that. All right. So something like that should work fine for us. And then this piece can also get laid back over top. And like that, the farmer is all set up. Let me just clean up this stuff in this area over here, and then we'll get on to our next character. Except that also before I forget, while I'm here, I also need the miniature for the farmer, which is this one right here. So I'll just set that right here as well. All right, and with that, let's move on to our second character for this place. Our second character will be the merchant. Same thing, I have played with her once before. So things have been reset to their original condition, pulling off all of the pieces as normal. Under here, you'll see there's nothing there. That's just a colored sort of tile that marks off the stuff here. I'm just going to pull everything out right now and I'll explain what everything is. Again, she's got skills as well that I'll just set right there. She will also get 10 coins from the bank, like that. And the first step of setting up the merchant's sort of play area is to set up these tracks over here. And to do that, I'm going to start by rolling a die, any die, and whatever the value that shows up is, one to three, I'm going to place one token of that type into the column at that location. The first is three, so I'm going to place this one here in the third spot on this track like that. Another three right there. Oh wow, I'm getting lucky. Another three right there. Put that back where it came from. And one more is a two like that. And we don't need that die anymore. It goes back into the supply. Then these four slots are actually going to be used during gameplay as sort of market supply or stockpile. And there should be four of each resource in each of these slots. So I'm going to take out all of the resources except for four of each kind in each of those slots. And you will see printed on here down in this corner. These numbers show us sort of the total amount of each of the different resources in the market. So you'll see here right now, because we're at this threshold, there's going to be six of each. So there's four of each in the stockpile right now. And that's because I personally will be starting with two of each of those resources. So I will have two of those, two of those, two of those, and finally two of these. And the rest of those will simply get placed into a supply. And I'm just going to place this supply up here in the corner just to get it out of the way. And then into that supply as well, there are two different, sorry, three different stages of rivals. You can see printed here as one, two, no, that's a three, sorry. One, two, and three like that. So I'm going to separate those into decks over here. 
And then there are two further decks of cards here, these tendency cards and here, these customer cards. So again, separating those into two stacks and shuffling all of those stacks. Actually, I'm going to move these up here because the last thing I need to do for this merchant is I need to set up our sort of marketplace. And to do that, starting with our board, we're going to look at what the sort of highest threshold of any of our resources are on this board. And right now they're all down in level one. But if any of one of these crosses this line, it will be level two. And again, if any one of those crosses this line, we would be in level three. And what that means is that dictates what kinds of rivals will be coming to us. So because we're in level one, we're going to take two of these rival cards, placing one here and one here like that. And then each of the rivals will also be given a tendency card face down. So place one there, one there like that. And then finally, there will be a customer shown and the customer always starts at the first rival face up like that. In addition, each of the rivals is going to start out with a number of goods and money as shown up here in the top left of the card. So in this case, this rival will have 10 coins and two of those and one of those. And sorry, I will check the names of the resources instead of just keeping saying those. So again, in this case, sorry, 10 coins, two furs and one wine. And those, of course, come from our stockpile and not the additional supply because the number of goods in our supply come from those numbers. So from here, I'm taking two of those furs and one of those wines. And they also start with 10 coins like that. And right now, they're nowhere near it, but there is a capacity printed on each card. And this says they can only hold eight goods at any one time. This rival starts with eight coins, two tools, and one food. So two tools like that, and one food. And again, remembering I have two of each, two food, two tools, two furs, and two wines in my own supply. And with that, we are all done, except that I should replace this board, which again is showing me the costs of the different resources in town. But in this case, also shows me sort of both seasonal and weather related effects on the market. And you'll see how that works in just a second as I get into gameplay. Also, these sort of market upgrades need to be placed out as well to be used later. And I'll place those up here in the supply area like that. Placing this one back on and finally taking the mini for the merchant which looks like this right here. And I'll place that out on her board like that. And the way that I'm gonna explain how things work is, first I'm just gonna go ahead and get started with a town action as normal because you should already know how that works from the first season. And then I'll take the character action turn with the farmer and then the character action turn with the merchant. But the first thing I do want to point out is that the farmer should sort of be focused on sprite actions early because they are going to need to start planting things before they can do anything else. But I will explain all of that in just a second. First things first, starting the turn, we are going to start by drawing a weather card. And this time we've got cloudy. And again, there are no three cards yet, so we can't have any effects triggered there. But based on this icon, we will read an event. So the first event this round, whoops, sorry, is event number six, and it says the fairies. Fairies aren't as reclusive as other sprites. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. This one was face up in my book because remembering as soon as events four through seven have been finished, we're gonna shuffle in event eight. So sorry, this was a mistake. That was already read in the first season, which is why it was already face up. So instead drawing the next event, is this one number seven. Rock golems, it says rock golems are rumored to live in caves and ravines. Strange rock formations are an indication that rock golems have been at work. While exploring the hills, rock golems appear behind your group. They wordlessly watch you build rock cairns, observing how you work together as a team. 
If the current value of all your sprite dice is more than your villager dice, shuffle an event 53. Well, we've got four sprite and two villager. So it is. So going back to that card, I am going to shuffle an event 53, then set this aside until four through seven have been resolved, and then I'll shuffle in event eight. And then it also says shuffle adventures 11 to 20 into the adventure deck. So we're going to set that aside with that other one. Because now 6 and 7 have been done. As soon as 4 and 5 are done, we'll shuffle in event 8. But right now I need to shuffle in event 53 and adventures 11 through 20. So then once more, adding in event card 53 and adventures 11 through 20, shuffling those into the stacks that we already have in the tray. Now, normally this is where the town actions would start, except that both of these characters do have something that can be controlled by the weather. The merchant is only going to have things that are controlled on sunny days and rainy days. On sunny days, the seasonal good will increase in value. And on rainy days, the seasonal good will decrease in value. And right now, cloudy doesn't affect that, so nothing's going to change here for right now. But then looking at the farmer... He's got different things that can happen as well. In the spring, sun will trigger something. In the summer, rain will trigger something. And in the fall, clouds will trigger something. Because we're in the summer and we pulled clouds though, nothing here is going to happen. But then coming back to the merchant, because after checking for that seasonal event, the marketplace is going to do something. Some kind of action will be resolved in the marketplace. And that's going to be determined by any symbol that's shown on the card. If there is an event symbol on the card, the rival themselves will perform an action. And if there is a sort of move building queue symbol, the green one with the arrow, means that the customer will buy at the market. So I'm going to go ahead and walk through how the rival will trigger right now because the rival has been triggered by that event symbol on my weather card. And to do that, we're going to... Choose the rival where the customer is, and right now the customer is at this rival, turning over this tendency card, and then following through the tendency card, doing the first thing that's possible for the merchant to do from the top to the bottom of that card. So looking at this card, we see three possible actions. This is buy, this is sell, and this is manufacture. So they're first going to try and buy two furs at the market. And if they can't do that, they're going to try and sell three wine goods. And again, if they can't do that, they will just manufacture one good. And that one good that they're going to manufacture is going to be sort of the star good or the main focus of that rival, which in this case is fur. They're focused on furs. Durin the Collector is focused on furs. And he does have 10 coins. And right now, looking at the market, furs are going to be costing three coins as printed here on the tray. So Duran needs to spend six coins in order to buy two furs. They easily can do that with 10 coins. So spending the 10 coins, they will get four coins back again. And they will take two furs from there. So now they're at four furs and one wine, which is still within their capacity of eight. And that is that. And then whenever a rival's action is done, that tendency card will get placed at the bottom of this deck, which really isn't going to matter because it's going to get shuffled, but it goes to the bottom because the next card on top becomes their next tendency. But then also the customer will move to the next rival. So we're sort of going to be alternating back and forth between the two rivals. And then that tendency deck does get shuffled back up again and placed off to the side one more time like that. And sorry, that's not true. The, the customer doesn't move. That was my mistake. The customer only moves after this customer has been resolved. The next customer will move to the other rival, not the current customer. So when that is done, we would place the used tendency at the bottom of this deck, place the top one here, give that a shuffle, and that is the end of the marketplace action. And now we will move into town actions, but I am going to change my original statement that I would wait until after the town action to explain each character because it's going to be very important for you to understand how each character plays and which, which actions are available for sprite versus villager, town actions, so that I can sort of focus on what it is that I want each of these people to be doing on their turns. 
So again, just like the other two characters, most of what you need to know is printed right here. These are the six, sorry, five different actions that the farmer can take. And those five actions going from top to bottom are plant, tend, harvest or clear, livestock, and then equipment. And the top three can be taken with a sprite action and the bottom three can be taken with a villager action. So going through the different actions, the first action, the plant action, is I'm going to choose one of these four plants up here to add into my farmland. And this first one is going to be free, but the other ones here will cost one coin, one coin, or two coins, respectively. And when I take them, I'm going to be placing them again with the untended, just planted side face up anywhere I'd like to in my farmland, except that if you are placing out a second tile of the same crop type, it needs to be placed adjacent to another, another area or the, the only other area of that crop type so that all of those crops are together. Otherwise, they can be placed anywhere you'd like to, adjacent or non-adjacent to anything else that's already been placed out. And then the next action is the tend action, and that is how we're going to take any tile that's been placed and simply flip it over to the other side, tending that crop. And you're going to want to do that because tended crops are going to be worth more money when you sell them at market, but also when we start upgrading things, sorry, getting new skills for our farmer, we will need to start using some of those tended crops as the things that we're paying to get the skills for that farmer. And it's worth mentioning that when you tend a crop, it doesn't need to fill the same space that it did before. Just like in the real world, if you put seeds, the flowers don't always grow or the crops don't always grow exactly where the seeds were. They tend to grow off in some direction. So when you tend the crop, when you flip that over, so long as one of the spaces of that tile is still in a space where there was a tile before or where there was part of the tile before, that is valid. So you can rotate and reorganize as you'd like so long as, again, it's still connected to whatever area holds that crop and at least one space of that crop is still filled. So I could potentially flip that exactly as it was like that. But I could, for example, rotate it to place it like that. I could place it over here like that and so on. So long as one of those original five locations still contains one space of that crop. The next action is harvest or clear. And harvest is simply going to be how we harvest our crops and turn them into money by selling them off. And you can see that each of these crops has a money value printed on it. So here this says two, but if this was tended into fully ripened strawberries, that then becomes five coins. So again, if you tend before you harvest, it's going to be worth more money. And again, when you harvest, you're simply going to choose one tile to remove from the board and place back into the supply, receiving however many coins are printed on that crop. And it's also worth mentioning that when you harvest, you are able to split up fields of the same type. So you could end up with more than one field of a similar crop or of the same crop through the harvest action. So while you're not able to plant crops separately from other crops, when you harvest, you can create multiple farms or multiple zones of each crop. The other thing that can be done with that same action is the clear action. And to do that, we're going to be able to remove one of these un unclaimed sort of land areas by spending whatever cost is printed on there. So if I'd like to remove this four piece over here, I'd pay four coins, two coins for this little one over here, five coins for this big one over here. Basically, you're paying one coin for each space that you are uncovering in that action. So you could choose any one of those, pay the cost and simply remove it from the board. And you'd basically just be doing that so you can have larger areas of connected crops. The next action is the livestock action that lets you buy, sell, move or breed livestock. To buy livestock, you're simply going to be paying three coins as it shows on that livestock token. And then you can place that into your farm. And when placing livestock into your farm, you can place it anywhere you'd like to. There are no restrictions about where it gets placed. So long as it's an empty space, the livestock can be placed into that location. Likewise, if you want to take that action and clear up some space in your farm, you can always sell livestock back to the supply. But when you sell it back, you only get two coins rather than the three that you need to pay to buy one. The next piece of that action is move. 
And move simply means you can take one livestock token from anywhere in your farmland and place it in an empty slot anywhere else. There's no sort of movement rules, just move it from one place to another on your board. And breed is what's going to happen if you have, say for example, two livestock tokens next to each other. You can choose to breed them by simply taking one of the livestock tokens from the supply for free and placing one adjacent to those two somewhere around them. So basically once you have two, you can continue getting more and more for free and then sell them off at a price of two coins each. So for that action, you can choose buy, sell, move, and or breed. You can do all four of them if you'd like to, but you can only do each of those one time. So I could buy one, sell one, move one, and or breed one livestock. And you can do that in any order you'd like. Then finally, the last action available to the farmer is the equipment action, which allows me to buy or sell equipment. And just like with the livestock to buy the equipment, you need to pay the coin cost printed on that equipment. And when you sell the equipment, if you no longer need the equipment, you would simply get a flat two coins back, just like with the livestock. But the equipment is going to be interesting in that when you buy the equipment, you don't automatically get the ability to use the equipment. Because in addition to the cost on the equipment, you'll also see a number of livestock printed on it. When you buy this equipment, you place it anywhere you'd like to in your farm with this side face up. And then when any of the spaces around this equipment contain a number of livestock equal to or greater than that number, the tile will then be flipped over and will allow you to make use of whatever that ability is. And then if for any reason the number of livestock decreases below that value, this would flip back over to the inactive side of the tile. So there are a variety of different equipments available to the farmer. And I'm just going to sort of go through them quickly down here. The sickle, when you harvest, allows you to harvest a second crop adjacent to the one that you harvested. Sorry, adjacent to the sickle, not to the one that you just harvested. The upgraded sickle, which costs 20 coins and needs two livestock instead of five and one. We'll do the same thing except that you can harvest two crops from a field adjacent to the sickle. The distributor, this wheelbarrow looking thing, says that any crops that are planted in a field adjacent to this distributor are immediately tended. So when you plant something next to this, it goes in with the tended side already up and you don't need to take the tended action. And the upgraded version of that does exactly the same thing except that it's three spaces instead of two so there are more spaces adjacent to that distributor. Next, we've got the fertilizer, and the fertilizer says that each time you harvest a crop from a field adjacent to the fertilizer, you're going to get an additional one coin in addition to the cost or the price of that crop that you're harvesting. And the upgraded fertilizer is going to do the same thing, except you're going to get two coins instead of one coin. Next, we've got the plow right here. The plow is after you perform a plant action, you can plant one additional crop into a field adjacent to the plow. So it allows you to plant additional things. And the upgraded plow does the same thing, except you can plant two additional crops into a field adjacent to the plow. The sprinkler right here, after you perform tend, you can tend an additional crop in a field that's adjacent to the sprinkler. And the upgraded, again, the same way, lets you tend two adjacent to that sprinkler. The only other thing left are the beehive and this petting zoo. The beehive simply gives you five coins at the end of every season, but it is going to cost you 20 to put it into your farm and it will require two livestock to keep it working. And the petting zoo is like a beefed up beehive. It does cost 35 coins to buy and requires four livestock around it, but it's going to give you 15 coins at the end of every season. So that's basically it for the farmer and you'll see that I don't have anything in my field yet. So realistically, I need to sort of take a planting action or a livestock action for now, although I could get one of the cheaper five or 10 coin equipments placed out in my field as well. Let me get those livestock out of there. So I think I'm gonna try and focus on something blue to get some plants in. And you'll see that the worker spaces for the dice are simply just going to trigger more of those actions again. Moving over to the merchant side of things, the merchant is basically going to be trying to beef up what they have available to them to sell at market, manipulating the different market prices 
and sort of trying to set things up so that when customers come to buy things, they are buying from the merchant and not from the rival whenever possible. The other big thing that you kind of want to focus on as the merchant is that all of their skills are going to basically cost these rival cards because you can, for a certain amount of money, which I'll explain in just a minute, basically buy out your rival. And if you buy out your rival, you get that rival card and then you're going to spend those rival cards to add these skills to the board as you did with the other characters. There is one thing I noticed when I was talking about manipulating the market is that I forgot one thing when I triggered the rival earlier and that is anytime something is bought from the market, the value of that good is going to increase once on this track and vice versa. Anytime something is sold to the market, the value of that good is going to decrease by one. So by buying and selling things, we will be able to manipulate the prices of the market. But that's only true when we're selling and buying from the sort of stockpile of the market. When a customer buys something that doesn't influence the cost or the price in the market. And let me talk a little bit about the customer before I talk about what it is that I'm doing, because this is one of the main focuses here. And you'll see that every customer has two things printed on their card. First, this top thing is going to tell me how this customer is going to manipulate the market. So in this case, the price of tools is going to decrease and then the customer is going to be buying two tools. And you'll see here in this corner, there is an arrow. In this case, the arrow is pointing up. That means this customer will be buying from whoever has the higher price of tools. So they're going to decrease the price of tools in the market and then they're going to buy from the more expensive seller. And the way that works is the seller price for the rival is printed on the rival's card. So this is the price that the customer will need to spend to buy anything from the rival. But for me, in order for the customer to buy something from me, they're going to need to pay whatever the price is in this sort of marketplace track over here. So both myself and the rival selling goods and buying goods from the stockpile will manipulate this. The customer will also manipulate that. And then I'm going to compare whatever my price is for that good. So in this case, if we were selling tools at this moment, the rival is selling for three and I am also selling for three. So there would be a tie. And in the case that there is a tie, the rival takes pref precedence or preference, but it also needs to be that that good is available. So in this case, this rival doesn't have any tools and I do have two tools. So I, even if I had the lower price, I would still be selling to this customer because the rival simply cannot sell. And in the case that ever I myself don't have anything in my supply and the rival itself doesn't have anything in their supply, the customer will also try to buy from the second rival, but that's the only time that the customer will buy from the rival they are not currently visiting. So my turn is going to be, allow me to do a bunch of different things. This first action allows me to sell. So I can simply take any of any number of one type of good, selling it back to the market stockpile for a price listed next to that item on this track. And then I will decrease this token down one space on that track. The next action is the stock action. And this is actually going to be me buying goods from the rivals themselves. I will spend a price listed on their card for those goods. And I will then simply take those goods from their card and add them to my card. And the reason I might want to do that is I told you that one of the things I'm focusing on doing is buying out my rivals. And that sort of cost that I need to pay to buy out a rival is going to increase based on the number of goods and coins that they have on their card. So if I can slowly start taking away some of their goods and then on a later turn, I will have to spend less money in order to buy out that rival. And again, when buying from the rival in this stock action, I have to choose one specific type of good and then I can buy as many of those as I'd like to. This next action is a two part action is either manufacture or trend. Manufacture means I can simply for free take one of any good from the stockpile into my supply or trend, which allows me to choose any one of the four goods and simply increase it by one on the track or decrease. Actually, I can go up or down. I'm changing the trend of that good. And then finally, the other thing that we can do here is an additional action called the upgrade action. And the upgrade actions or sorry, the upgrade tokens 
are these little tokens that I set off to the side. And you'll see that there's one of each of the four colors. And then there are these two sort of wild upgrades. For the normal upgrades, I simply need to spend 10 coins plus the cost of whatever slot I would like to place that into in order to place that out. If I want to place out these fancier sort of wild upgrades, I need to have first placed out all four of the regular colored ones. And then for these, I spend that same 10 coins plus the cost of the row. But I also then need to have one of those bought out rival cards to spend as well in order to place one of those wild tokens. And the way that the tokens work is, for example, here I've got the first token. I would spend 10 coins plus, say in this case, four coins, placing that in the slot here. And that means that any time that token then moves up or down this track, it will always skip over that space. So I'm basically influencing how easy it is to trend or to change the level of that good at market. The next action is the guild action, which is that sort of buyout or takeover that I keep talking about. And in order to do that, I need to figure out the value of the rival that I'm trying to buy out. And the way to calculate that value is first to count all of the coins. So in this case, one, two, three, four coins, plus the price or the value of each of these goods at market, not from the rival's card, but at market. So here they've got four fur, which is three each times four is 12 then one wine, which is also three, so 15, and then one, two, three, four coins is a value of 19. And then to buy out that rival, I need to pay a number of coins equal to twice their value. So right now they're worth 19, I would need to spend 38 coins in order to buy out that rival. And this rival, I just realized, forgot their coins, is eight coins like that. So to buy out this rival, again, three, six, nine, because everything's at three right now, 369 plus 8 is 17 times 2. I'd need to spend 34 coins to buy this rival out as well. And again, when I do that, everything from that card clears. These coins go back to the supply. These goods go back into the market stockpile. That card would get flipped face down and become my acquired rival card. And then I would put this tendency card at the bottom, place out a new tendency card, place out a new rival according to whichever level I'm at at the time and then continue play. And again, those acquired rival cards can be used for adding those wild upgrades that I just talked about and or buying or adding skills to my merchant. And then finally, the last action down here is buy. And buy works just like the rivals buy in that I'm buying from this market stockpile, paying the cost shown here for each good. Again, buying any number of one type of good that I'd like to. And then once I've finished buying, I will move the token for that good up one space on the track. And then just like with every other character, the dice go into these slots for the workers, trigger the action as printed. And if there are any skills next to the action when the character takes that action, I will also be able to use those skills. So again, because I'm not able to do level two or three skills at the moment, let me quickly run you through the level one skills for the farmer and the merchant, and we'll go ahead and get into gameplay. So for the farmer, for a cost of one strawberry and one bean, I can get green thumb, which allows me to take a plant action on a cloudy day. For a cost of one strawberry and two potatoes, tended of course, on a rainy day, I can do the tend action. For a cost of one strawberry, one potato, and one bean, I can do rancher, which allows me to, when I take the action associated with this skill, breed one cow additionally to whatever I did. And then harvester for one potato and two strawberries, I can, on a sunny day, take one free harvest action. Like that. And then same for the merchant. Looking at their level one skills, you'll see first that all of their level one skills is simply going to cost one acquired rival card, which is what the symbol means right here. And they've got four different skills. The first one, satisfied customer, is going to allow them to draw a new customer card to replace the existing customer that's already out and then shuffle the old customer back in. 
loyalty lets you spend one coin to increase the value of a sprite die or a villager die that you have sort of on your own player board. Off the books, whenever you sell something, or sorry, you'll be able to sell an additional thing, right? If you take the action this is associated with, you then take a single sell action, but you do not decrease the value of that good. And then finally, the handshake deal will allow you to take a buy action from your rival. That symbol there means the rival. So you're going to be able to buy one thing from the rival. But at this case, you're not spending the price of the rival. You're going to be spending the market value to buy from the rival because that is a buy action and not the other stock action. So those are the four skills available to me for the merchant. Let's go ahead and get into playthrough. Now, for the merchant, I do see that I want the highest tool value. He's at three, so I want to get to four. But also, before the customer buys tools, they're going to decrease it. So I'd like to boost this twice if I can. So I want to take a buy action, which is orange. But realistically, even if I take something else, like I could always take that trend action to simply push it up. So I'm going to send her on an adventure. We also need to remember that our goal for this season is that my food must be at two or higher. So I don't want my food to go any lower than it is already. But that's okay because looking over here, my trading post for two production, one income and one culture, I could build out a trading post. I've already got one production. I've already got way more than enough culture. I just need one income, which is 10 for him or five for her. And one more production, which is 15 here and 10 here. So if he gets a production and she gets an income, we could build the trading post without touching our food. So we'll think about that as well. But she's going to take an adventure action, and he's actually going to go and get some sprites. So he'll spend five coins to take two sprites, and I'll take the blue three and the orange two. And the reason I'm going to do that for him is because most of the stuff that he does is one tile at a time. But having the sprites doing extra work, or sorry, the workers doing extra work on his farm, he'll get more stuff done. So that's going to be important for him. So he's done. She takes an adventure card, drawing the top adventure card. This is one of the new ones we just added. And this is going to be a special one, and you'll see why in just a second. This is Into the Unknown. It says, you've never been here before. Choose one. Roll a villager die or roll a sprite die. And this symbol means at the tower. Right now, we only have a, a sprite die available to us, so we're going to have to take B. It says if there's nothing at the tower, nothing happens. There is. We're going to roll this sprite die. After rolling the die, flip this over to read the results. And then once I've completed this, the reason I said this is special is this one actually gets shuffled back into the adventure deck. It's never going to come out of the game. So let me roll that sprite die. And the cool thing is whenever I roll this, it stays that way. So it was a 1. So if I roll a 2 or a 3, ooh, a 3. Now that stays at the tower as a three. We flip that over and it says B. With a three, you find fossilized rocks that reveal past creatures in their history. On top of that, they're beautiful and may attract visitors. So I'm going to lose four coins means each of us loses four. Oh, no, sorry. This is the girl who's on the adventure. So the merchant will lose four coins, but we gain one culture, which is great because I wanted more culture. So she's going to lose four coins. One, two, three, four. But we gain one culture. Ah, uh, no, culture is not what I needed. I needed income and production. Oh, well. Not horrible to have extra, though. Okay, then. That means she is, from that card, going to be taking a sprite action, a blue action, from the top here. And he is going to be taking either, because I bought one of each, die. So I will... Have him take a blue action, which is going to be plant. This is already a very nice big five-piece plant. It's going to be worth a lot, and it's free, so I'm going to plant that one. And I'll just start it down here like that. Whoops. Untended, of course. Then after he does that, we are going to take worker actions if I want to, and I do want to. I'm going to tick this one down to two to take one more plant action, spending one coin to plant one more strawberry. 
like this. And remember, I might change the orientation of that after it gets planted, or sorry, tended. And actually, we're going to do that right now. So I'm going to take this down once to tend this one. And you'll see now, as long as one of those four spaces still has the prop in it, I'm going to flip that and place it like this. Because now I've got more space. It fills in that space very nicely. That's the end of his action. She's on blue. So I am just going to use trend to push the tool up one space like that. They both come back. End of the round, the dusk phase. These workers go back in here. And for the farmer, we slide all of these over and draw more tiles to fill in there. A three size strawberry and a potato four. That's the end of that day. Let's go to our next day drawing a weather card. And we've got a sunny day with nothing happening. So sunny day means, first off, we check here, nothing's happening because there's only two weather. We are in the summer, so we're looking for rain for him. Nothing happens. Over here, a sunny day means we're increasing. And in the summer, that means wine. So wine value increases by one. No symbol there means nothing happens at the marketplace we take our actions again. Then, I need to start making some money for her. I need to push that up one more because if he pushes it back down, it's going to three and we won't be able to do that. He's also buying two, so I don't want to sell any of those right now. I could buy another one, but that's going to be more expensive now. I'm probably going to do that, so I don't really care which action she takes. I would like him to potentially sell something. because more money would be nice, especially if I need to start buying some resources to build that trading post. Yeah. So she's going to go there again. He's looking to harvest, which could be either as well. And I don't have anything desperately needed right now, so I'm actually going to go to the longhouse just to take a coin for him. So he's at five. She takes another adventure card, which says, Old Sack Pants. You chance across the sprite the villagers call Old Sack Pants. A short creature wearing the odds and ends discarded by villagers is clothes. A burlap sack on each leg and a torn leather pack for a mask. While they look a little goofy to you, the creature has a certain proud bearing you can't help but admire. Sack Pants waves to you tentatively. So I can give them a warm greeting and compliment their attire, or I can offer to get them some real clothes and lose one. I think offering real clothes is a little bit of an insult. So I'm going to do A, give them a warm greeting and compliment the attire. It says, A, sack pants drops their chin bashfully. If you didn't know better, you'd say they were blushing. They go on their way with a little extra spring in their step, and you feel encouraged to think outside the box. Ah, I could have gotten a free sprite recruitment if I had done B, but this means the value of all sprite at the tower increased by one. Unfortunately, it's already at three. But that is also blue and orange. If it'll focus blue and orange so I can choose which I want to do this turn. All right, then coming back to here, he's going to come, he's going to harvest that strawberry. Ah, uh, wait. It doesn't really matter what order I do things in. Actually, he's going to, getting to choose a color from there, Tend this strawberry. So flips that over like that. Because then I can use that die here to harvest. And sell off that strawberry for five coins. Putting it back into my bag. Five. Then, using the sprite, setting it to one. I'm going to plant one more strawberry for free in here like that. And again, when this is done and it flips, I will put it down here. I just want to make sure that that space there is full. So like that works for right now. That is his action. Now she gets to choose either as well, but she's actually just going to trend up one more time like that. They both come back. 
Next day, checking weather. And you've got a rainy day with an event triggered. So first things first, cloud, sun, rain doesn't do anything. Then we are going to trigger the event. And we've got event number 53, so not one of those four through eights. So it's a rocky road. Shouts and yells echo from a construction site. The workers are arguing about a material shortage with a project. Just as things come to a head, a strange new voice chips in. Stop it! That's not how you work together! Gotta be team! Make better stuff! Between the workers is a rock golem with its arms out, gesticulating wildly. To the villagers' surprise, the golem is teaching them tips on how to procure the best granite and sandstone. Gain? Yay! Production? If my production is the highest resource, we add one more villager at the tower. It's not, unfortunately, so we're not getting the villager, but... We do get an extra production, which is nice, because that's what I want for this. We still need one culture, but she can get culture for five, so that's awesome. Then, event does trigger the rival again here, still working at him. He wants to buy two of the foods, which are three each. He doesn't have six coins, so he's going to skip to the next thing and sell to market three hammers. He doesn't have any hammers, so all he's going to do is influence the good that they're looking at, which is the furs. Sorry, not influence, but manufacture. So he's going to take one fur for free, but there aren't any furs either. So there's nothing that they can do. But there's also, I forgot, before taking the marketplace action, it was a rainy day, so I should be decreasing the value of the wine because that is the summer good, like that. All right, now we will take our actions, and sorry, I forgot to reset these. This should have gone back. And this one goes here. Those all slide over at the end of the last round, which I forgot again. And we've got our first bean crop, a little three guy. Then what are we going to do? I want her to come here. And she's going to spend five coins to move the culture up one. So now we have enough stuff to build that trading post when we want to in a minute. But first I'm going to need to clean out something to put it in. Then he's gonna huh, go on an adventure or get more dice again. No, I think I'm gonna leave the dice for her to have next time. He's gonna go on an adventure. That adventure is Natural Bay. It says, from the top of the valley, people have been able to see the ocean nearby. No one has established an easily traversed path, but on this hike, you can hear rushing water and taste salt in the air. Making careful note of landmarks, you find your way to a protected bay. It's connected to the ocean and also fed by a waterfall. The sea life here is vibrant. When you return to town and tell of this idyllic spot, someone offers to build a wharf there. Yay! Add fishing grounds to the construction crew, and that is an orange action. So here is fishing grounds, and you'll see that it starts in slot one of the queue right up here like that. He's taking an orange action. She's taking a blue action from here. So for him, that means harvest or cows or equipment. And I might start looking at getting some equipment. But he doesn't have a whole lot of money yet. I want to... Yeah, you know what? I'm going to take equipment. Spending five coins to take this sickle. And I'm going to put that sickle here. Yeah, here is fine like that. It means I'm going to need a livestock next to it, but that'll happen soonish. Lost my coin. And then I am going to use this sprite to take it down to tend. It means this one now gets tended like that. Ah, but I just realized that was a silly placement because the sickle doesn't need to be next to the tile that I'm harvesting. It just has to be next to a field that I'm harvesting. So I'd rather place it, say, up here so that I have the potential to connect to other fields out there. Then she's taking blue. This is already okay with me. Nothing's really worth all that much money, but she's out of stuff. 
He's good with tools. He's good with furs. Yeah, I'm going to sell. You know what? Wine is this season's good, and it might get kicked up a little bit with the sun. So if it drops a little bit, I don't mind, I guess. Although food is coming next. Yeah, you know what? I'm just going to sell two food as my action, putting those two back and taking six coins. Like that. Then everybody comes back again. I'm making a mess for the next day, which is a cloudy day with a building advancement. Looking here, sun, rain, clouds does nothing. Again, his thing is triggered by rain, not by clouds. This is going to move, except I'm out of luck because I didn't open any spaces, so that's stuck there until the next time that happens. Whoops. I should have probably focused on clearing a space rather than buying that culture this time, but that's okay. Then that construction building means that my customer is triggered. So the first thing that's happening is the tools worth is going down one. Then they're trying to buy two tools from the most expensive tools. Not checking here. So here is three, I am four. So he's buying two tools from me. One, two. Those go back there for a cost of four. Each is eight. One, two, three, and five means five, 10, 15 coins I've got right now. Remembering I need like over 30 at least to buy out anybody. That doesn't change because he bought, not us. He goes away. New customer comes out to the other rival and that gets shuffled up like that. Next customer is going to increase food and decrease tools and he's trying to buy one of the most expensive food and two of the cheapest tools. But this guy's tools are five, so already at four, that's great for me. I can even go up one more without risking anything, especially because I don't have any tools right now. But the most expensive food, two, I'm at three already as well, so we're good, except I already got rid of both my food and my tools, so I'm gonna need to sort of boost some stuff up. All right, then. What do we need to do? I need to clear some stuff out of there, but also I want sprites. This sprite goes back at the end of the round, like that. Then, we need to clear two spaces, realistically, because, yeah, that fishing ground's coming out, and whatever we build will also eventually be coming out. Who do I want to do that with? He needs dice. I'm gonna go here. Spend her five to clear out a space. A fishing ground is probably a good idea to put it on the water. So let's do here number 12, which gets me one of anything. Yay. Let's go with income because it's low. Then he is going to go here, spend his last five coins. Means I better harvest something to take that three and that one. That one's not great, but it's what I got. Then... I wanna. With her, she's got a blue action. And I think I'm just gonna take this to manufacture one tool. Like that. And that's her turn. He's gonna take blue or orange as I like. He has no money. I really wanted to add livestock and I can't. So I need money. So I am gonna take a harvest action. Harvesting that strawberry for four like that. I am going to use this sprite to plant. And I'm going to start a new field over here that is potatoes. Uh, hold on. Yuck. Yeah. Over there that is potatoes. And I'm going to use this, unfortunately, only one use to spend three coins to take livestock Place that livestock here next to my sickle. Which does mean that that sickle flips over like that. Good. That's the end of both their turns. This gets re-rolled and back. Yay, three. These slide down. Like that. We got a potato square. These guys come back again. New weather card, which is a sunny day 
with an event happening. So sun goes there. Rain cloud sun does nothing. It needed to be cloud rain sun. Event is triggered. Our next event is number 50, which says, the social sprites. The fairies have been strangely absent since your group climbed their trees, and you can't help wondering if they are somehow offended. However, as the days pass, it becomes apparent that isn't the case. Townsfolk start catching glimpses of tiny faces peering in at the windows. The fairies are curious about all the goings-on in the town, but seem to congregate around places where people gather to socialize. So I get to build the tavern at no cost. And it says, if you've already built the tavern, I gain food and culture. The problem is, in order to build the tavern, I need to have already built the general store, and I didn't. So I cannot build the tavern, so nothing is going to happen from that event, unfortunately. Which means, I want her to build. Uh, hold on, before I do that, sorry. Sun makes wine increase by one. Then event means the rival is doing something, and I realize this shouldn't be here. So that's that. And then this rival is going to try N. It's not cloudy. He's trying to sell three of the apple symbol means this season's good. So he's trying to sell three wine. He doesn't have any wine. So instead he's going to manufacture one tool like that. So again, she's building. And he is going here for an adventure. Now the build is going to be a little bit interesting, but this is a good thing because it gets, allows me to show you something I haven't yet. We're building the trading post, which costs. One income, two production, one culture. And then this trading post says that it should be placed in the first space, but there's already something in the first space. So instead, it's going to get placed in the next available space, which is the second space there. Then going on an adventure with the farmer, the farmer has discovered an old well, which says you find an old well boarded over and abandoned, but notice the glint of light reflecting within. Curious, you pry open the boards and see there is something shiny down there. A small adorned jewelry box. Getting it will be dangerous and you'll need supplies. Choose how many coins you'll spend on supplies from 0 to 10. I only have one coin, so 1 it is. 1 to 2, it says, you climb down but admit defeat after a few fruitless hours. At least you get out safely. Okay. And that is an orange or villager action. So an orange action, unfortunately, is not one I wanted to take, but I will harvest the strawberries, which means I'm allowed to then harvest this potato, but it's only worth one, and I don't think I want to do that. So that's four coins. And I am going to use this sprite then to plant something. Strawberries or more potatoes. Oh, sorry, that's not plant, that's harvest, but that's better anyway. I want to turn that one like, hmm. I didn't think that through very well, but that can go like that. Still adjacent to the harvest. She needs to take an orange action as well. I need a second tool. And food, so she's just going to manufacture a tool. They both come back. Market didn't change, so it doesn't need to reset. We move to the next day. All right, then drawing our next weather card. Uh, but first putting this back there. We've got another sunny day with a building queue movement. Again, cloud sun sun means nothing, but this fishing ground is being built, which gets us this Right die flips over here like that. So adding one more sprite die to the board. Two. And this vision ground is going to say that this is a building I can place on. And it says I can forego my character action and then trade either income or production to make food or culture. Okay. This one also moves up one. I need to build a space for that before it's too late. But I'm not doing great with money. I want to look at skills just because I do want to build a skill before we're done. Potato and two strawberries. 
strawberry and two beans, one of each, or strawberry and two potatoes. I've already got a potato. You can see lots of potatoes and strawberries. So either strawberry and two potatoes or one of each look like good things to focus on for right now. I want to plant some stuff, but I still do have that. Getting more dice is definitely a good idea for him. She needs to buy out a guy, but that's not going to happen with the way that her money's working out right now. But that's okay. Then, yeah, let me send him here, spending all of his money. He's only got five left. Let's take that two and that three like that. And realistically, she could clear out this because the next thing could be a building, in which case that needs a place to go. So let's do that. She's going there to spend five to remove a place for a trading post. Let's put it on the water near our longhouse. I get one food, which is good because that's the goal I'm aiming for this season. Then she gets blue, he gets whatever I want him to have, which is likely gonna be blue. Yes, so we're gonna take, uh, I don't have any money left. No, we're changing our minds a little bit here. He's taking, well, it doesn't matter orange or blue, he's gonna harvest. He's selling those potatoes for four. Because I'm going to use a, a bunch of stuff to get some stuff happening here. Means uh, I can only do it once, though. Oh, well. Yeah, that was silly. But he didn't have any money otherwise. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Hold on. But I will do that. He's planting. Which lets me take this strawberry for free and place it wherever I want to. I'm going to bury it down here. Like that. And there. Then, the harvest action does happen, but he's doing it here. Placing that two, which did then get rid of that potato. So I do have those four. Because now I'm going to tick one of these down to a one. Plant again, spending one and planting out a new potato. And I'm going to stick that like this. It's likely going to flip and fill in that hole. And then ticking this one down to tend. And I will do that right now. Flipping that over like that. Okay. Then she takes her blue action, which is going to be... He wants two hammers, two tools, and a food. I'm going to take a food for free. Like that. Wait, no. Pause. I completely forgot to do her market stuff. It's sunny, so wine goes up one. Then, this should have triggered before we did anything. Green goes up one. Orange goes down one. Highest green is three, but I don't have any. Because his is two. So he is going to sell that one green for two bucks. Which makes that ten. Like that. And then he's going to buy two tools from the lowest. I'm at three. They're at five. So he's going to buy both tools from me for three each. Which gets me six coins. Five and six like that. All right, now is my turn anyway, but this customer is gone. New customer comes out. I'm looking to sell wine. He wants the most expensive wine, which for me is four and for them is two, which is great. Yeah. So I want three wines, and I've got two, so instead I am just going to take one wine for free like that. And that is that. She comes back. He comes back. Those slide over. These reset. Oops. Oh, a three. Pulling two more goods for his farming area. A strawberry and beans like that. Next day. Weather is rainy. And yay, look, there is a building Q movement, so I'm glad I opened that up. 
Rain, rain, uh, sorry, sun, sun, rain does nothing. This moves up. So I can take either income or that one, which I want. Production. And I get one more villager in town coming to do some trading at the trading post. This flips over and goes there. And this is going to allow me to take a building action here by placing my character there. Spending two coins, I can change any one resource into one other resource. Then it's not really going to matter too much because I'm probably not going to get there in this playthrough. But from the buildings we've been placing out, we have unlocked a few more. From the general store, I can now build a monument, a post office, or a tavern. From the fishing ground, now I can build a port. And from the trading post, I can now build a lumber yard and a bakery. So I'm just setting those over there. I don't know that I'm going to be building anything else in this playthrough, but I did want to put those out so you could see them. Then rain does mean that the value of wine goes down one. The building queue does mean, uh, also, sorry, rain on summer also means that we get to flip that one for free, tending my strawberry field. Like that. And then the building queue means that we're triggering here, so wine goes up one more time. The lower wine, ah, that's lower wine? That's a problem. Lower wine sells three, but he's only got one, so he's going to sell one for two. Changing four into six. He still wants to buy two more wines, so I'm going to sell two more wine for four coins, each getting me eight. And two is ten like that. Then taking some actions, I need him to get beans and upgrade them, which we can do with any of those things. But not this turn. So he's going to adventure. I might as well get, hold on, this customer gets replaced over here like that. He's increasing furs and will buy the cheapest furs, three of them, which he has lots of. We still have two, though. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what they're worth because he can't sell any. And I also realized that this should have been replaced. Sorry. She's gonna, what's she got, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Or well, threes, this is 19 times two. This is six and 12, it's 18 times two. We're not anywhere near any of that. She needs to make money and not spend money. But, 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 yeah. Having dice is not a bad thing though, but. I don't know. I think I'm just going to go there and get her a coin. So she's at 20. She needs 18 more to buy out somebody. He's getting an adventure, which is... A tale of two dogs. Cutting across the prairie, you happen upon two puppies. One has a lolling tongue, boundless energy, and a friendly demeanor. The other is much more serious and has penetrating eyes. They appear lost, but when you approach, they back off in opposite directions. You could probably catch one, but not both. I think that the serious dog needs a little love. Let's go B. Once you catch the serious dog, it eventually follows you back to town at a distance. She turns out to be a great guard dog. Later in the evening, it scares off some raccoons that have been getting into the food supply. Gain food. Thanks, dog. For food. Then, that dog was a sprite action, so he's got blue. So he's going to plant that guy somewhere doesn't really matter where let's put that there because they're going to go away next turn anyway i am going to use that sprite to harvest sorry not harvest tend those beans and orange i'm not doing anything with because i don't want to harvest anything because i want to get a skill next turn and i don't want to spend more money on cows Although, if I do, I could start breeding them. What's the one I'm building? I'm building a rancher, which is the breeding. Yeah, you know what? Let's do that. 
Spending three coins, using him there, taking down to one, like that. We'll put our other cow right next to that one, like that. They both come back. This slides over and resets. This sprite goes home. Pulling out one more of those. Next round, a turn, is a rainy day with nothing happening. Sun, rain, rain triggers nothing. Rain means he gets to tend something, but everything's been tended. Rain means the cost of wine or the price of wine decreases. Then, ah, sorry, she never took her turn last turn. She went here blue or orange. She could have done whatever she wanted to. I will say that she took. He's got no blues. There are no blues because they're all here. And to buy from him, I got to spend four and that's worth nothing. So I'm going to increase the price of blue like that. All right, then back to the next turn. Selling purples right now gets her four. She's only got one of them. Two blue, that's 12, 32, 42, no, 32, which isn't going to help because they got too much stuff over there. They need money. But that's fine. She's just going to do that again and take a coin. Not really a good thing to do, but it is what it is. He's going on adventure again because why not? The adventure this time again into the unknown. You've never been here before. Choose one. Roll orange or blue. I've got both this time. Let's go. He wants to be blue, probably. Oh, wait a minute. That was a mistake. We're doing that backwards. I'm still doing the adventure. She didn't get that coin because my plan all along was to get a skill. So I'm going to get the rancher skill. And to do that, I need to spend one bean, one potato, and one strawberry from my field tended, placing those back into the bag. And now I can place out this rancher skill wherever I'd like to. And I see that I'm probably doing some tending, or sorry, planting soon. So let's do that. So anytime I plant, now when I plant, not with a worker die, just myself, I will also be able to breed. Yes. And I will, this is orange or blue, so I will choose blue for him. But let's go back to here. Now, she could sell purples, but I'd rather start pushing more stuff up. So I don't really care orange or blue because that'll increase prices. So I'm going to roll the orange because last time we did blue. I got a two, which says, A, with a two, a new fishing hole is found. Lose one production and gain food. That's not great, but it's not horrible either. That let's be, choose orange for her, and that gets shuffled back in again because that was into the unknown. So then for him, I will plant these potatoes. And I'm going to plant them so that they are, I'd love to put them here, but then if I breed, there's nowhere to put the cow. So you know what? I'm just going to stick them down here at the bottom like that which means I get a free breed, so I do get a cow. Goes up there like that. And I don't have any use for that, so I'm not doing anything. He comes back, she comes back, we draw another weather, which happens to be the last weather card of this season, is another cloud with an event happening. Rain, rain, cloud does nothing. Cloud helps nothing here, cloud does nothing here. Oh, these should reset like that. Placing out a strawberry there, but event happens. And we get event card number 125, which says, Watcher in the woods. Your group can't shake the feeling of being watched as they work. Occasionally at the edge of the forest, there appears to be movement, but whenever anyone looks, there's no one there. All they find are giant footprints and some dark fur. Shuffle adventure card 80 into the adventure deck. So shuffling that one in like that. We take our last turns of this season, except that the action means that this guy 
is going to activate. He's trying to buy two wine. Wine costs three coins each. Yes, so 10 minus six is four. One, two, three, four, like that. Buying two wine. Uh, hold on. No, that was his cost. He should have two less. Those wine to buy are four each. So that goes up one. He gets two wine, which is sad because now that's eight and nine is 17, 18, 19 still. The only way I can buy them out is if I can tank the value of wine, but that's not going to happen this turn. And these guys again are 16, 17, 22, 44. Ouch, that's not happening. This goes away. That gets replaced. And we take our turn. I'm not going to be able to show you buying out a rival, unfortunately. So the only sort of fun things left to do are, I will definitely do one more adventure. It doesn't really matter who. She's got a lot of money. So let's say she comes there and spends the five coins to take two dice like that. He goes on adventure. The last adventure for this playthrough is this one here. More lost than they know. A couple of boisterous loggers argue on the road, wandering in the vague direction of your town. I'm telling you, we took a wrong turn. Beautiful place, though. Have you ever been here? We better hurry back to the logging zone or we're going to be in trouble with the boss. They're lost and seem to be pleased to find you. Good morning. You can A, point them toward the village and invite them to stay, or B, point them back the way they came and trust they will not find the valley a second time. Yeah, let's invite them in. A, the loggers are taken in by the valley's beauty and agree to work around town for a very reasonable price. Yay. We get one more villager and we get to discover more land for free. So adding one more villager like that, we've got one and I get to discover a land for free. Doesn't really matter. Let's do this one right here, which is one more culture. Like that. End of our town action, we come back. That was orange for him. So I might as well do a harvest action like that. I can't really spend this for anything because there's no other action that I can do based on what's on my board. I never really made use of that sickle. She gets to choose a color and realistically I'd push this blue up to make it worth more because I see that's coming except that this is the last round of this. So that's not going to change anything because instead I can use that to sell purple for four. That goes down, I get four coins for purple because everything is gonna reset at the end of the season as far as what the market's doing. So I'll take four coins like that. Then with orange, it's not gonna matter. It's gonna say push something up, but then I'm gonna do it and it's gonna go right back down again. But why not? Whoops, push that to one, push the blue up one, then use this to sell the blue goods, pushing back down again. Two of those at four each is eight, nine, ten, like that. And that is the end of the season. So basically we reset and do everything again as we do at the end of the season. First checking for any buildings that get me something. This one does get me one culture at the end of the season. Then we're going to check our goal card. And remembering our goal card said I had to have food at two or higher, it's at five, so I succeed. And success means I gain a culture and shuffle in goal card 14. So I would take 14, and shuffle in that goal. Then taking that, shuffling it up and drawing two at random, we've got the work of art, which would mean the total value of sprites at the tower is 10 or higher or accelerated growth, the highest town resource must be four higher than the lowest. So in this case, I can see that the culture is six and production is zero. So that would probably be a safe bet. I would choose that one. Then these cards reset for the next season. And then finally, we would replace summer with fall like that. Then at the end of each season, we also do some things for our characters. 
for the farmer, we're going to choose one of the sprite dice at the tower, rolling it, and then based on that value, in this case I got a 1, we have to add the number of untamed tokens back to the farm based on the value that was rolled. And in this case, when adding untamed land, it's okay for them to be adjacent to each other, unlike it was during setup. If there's no way for them to fit, you do have to sort of remove other things from the farm for them to fit. But in this case, because I actually didn't ever clear any in this first season, nothing would happen, but that is normally how it would occur. And then again, for the merchant as well, we'd reset everything here. So these cards all get cleared away because all of these sort of rival merchants are going off to the next town to sell their goods and a whole new wave will come in. So all of these go back into the supply. These cards would get shuffled back into the rival deck here like that. The tendency cards will get shuffled back into this tendency like that. Same thing with the customer like this. And then we reset. Now, because two of my goods have crossed that threshold, we would now be using level two rivals. So again, we would draw two rivals like that. Two tendency cards like that. One customer starting here. Each of the rivals gets what it shows on their card. So this guy gets 10 coins. This one gets 12. And then Gorlfin the miner would also get two hammers or two tools and one wine. And Sarulda, the herbalist, would get two wine and two tools. Huh, look at that. They are trying to sell the same wares. I'm not so sure that's smart for them, but that's what they do. Then we also need to check the total number of things in the marketplace based on the current level. So now because two of these things have gone to level nine, that means, or sorry, level two, that means both the furs and the wine should have nine available rather than six. So from the supply up here, I would be adding three more fur and three more wine into my supply. And that is the end of the season, and that is where I stop. Now, I do want to sort of talk about components overall. You've already seen all of the trays. I've already reset the other two characters, and I'm going to show you right now how these two characters reset so that you can understand that for your play. But also, while I'm here, I just want to talk about all of the different things. The card quality here is great. The artwork in this game is gorgeous. I love the way that everything looks. I love the character design. I love the sprites design. Everything looks really, really cool. The trays, for the most part, are very, very nicely designed. I'm going to talk about specifics in a second. The only one small complaint, and I don't know if you can see this on camera, but these trays have all sort of started to curve up like that. And it may be because I've had it out on a table in a dry room for a while, and that's possibly true, but it is a little bit of a shame that these things are so nicely designed, but they are curling up in all four corners just a bit, which again is a little bit sad. The way that everything slots in and fits in, the save system in this game, which I'm just about to do in another second, is amazing. It unpacks and repacks so quickly and so easily. Everything stays in exactly as it is while you're playing. The way that it's designed, the way that it works, really, 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 really cool. The minis, I've sort of shown them to you already, but here are two of them again up close. And let me grab the other ones to show you right now, just because the sculpts on these minis are great. And I'm not even sure I'd call them minis because they are so chunky and just really, really cool, deserving of a paint job if anybody out there is a good painter. Really, really awesome minis. Again, card quality artwork, really cool. The bags for the farmer and the crafter are very nice velvet or velveteen kind of material. Nice size, easy to get your hands in and out of, but not huge to take up a ton of extra space. The tray design, as I said, the save system here is really wonderful. It is a little bit fiddly getting things in and out. The crafters sticking those sort of sticks in and out of the, of the things gets a little bit 
tricky sometimes. More importantly, because everything's slotted in this way on the crafter, sometimes it's hard to see the colors without flicking through all of the things and seeing what's in there. Um, the farmer here, you saw every once in a while I was struggling, like right now this middle livestock, or at least one of these livestocks, doesn't lay down flat because it's just a little bit too tight. This five down here, as I was trying to stick things in before, doesn't quite fit in there because it's a little bit tight. This merchant one I didn't show you or I didn't end up using, but these upgrades are really tiny and they do fit in there very nicely, but it's a little bit, let me use one that's different color so it's easier to see. They, they slot in there nicely, but everything is just a teeny bit fiddly to move things in and out. And every time I pop this in and out while that little thing is in there, it works because these are nicely rounded. So the edges can push down and pop out and it works. Everything works very well. The design is very nice. It just does get slightly fiddly as you're playing with all of that stuff. But again, I have to say the design of these is wonderful. Let me go ahead and save these so you can see what would happen. Again, these dice would go back out here if you're changing characters. But let's say we're not changing characters, then that stays there. These should come back like that. Then for the farmer, all of the unused crop tokens, means the ones that haven't been placed out, would be dumped out of the bag. Although I suppose you could keep them in the bag, but under here is this big area for all of the crops we're not using. They all get tossed in there like that. Of course, the ones that have been placed out stay placed out. In the same way, all of the and that needs a little jiggling to get it all in there, but it does fit. All of the livestock and tools or equipment go back into this little bucket over here. If he had any coins, they would go over here in that corner over there. And again, assuming that we would be using this character again next time, the die would stay there. If not, that would get rolled back like I did last time. All of this stays the same way. All of the skills we haven't used Go back into here like that. The skills that we do use or did get stay there. Everything stays where it is. This flips back in like that and everything is reset. Now again, this does need a little bit of shuffling to get everything to fit flat, but it works and it's in there. And the important thing is because the tray has a lid, as soon as I put this lid on, everything is in and doesn't move around and will stay that way until the next time I play the game. So that's the farmer. Then saving the merchant. Again, these dice stay here. Coins get put back into here like that. And realistically, because I would have been playing again, I set all of this up, but because I'm saving, all of this actually just goes back in. And the next time we play, with this character, we would just set all of that up from scratch. So all of the goods that are being used right now go here. And all of the goods that are not available at all to us go back. In here again, we can place in all of the skills like that, that aren't being used. All of my upgrades can easily just go down here into this bottom corner like that. Then the cards all go back into their respective decks. These cards get placed into that well there. The rival cards all get stacked together like that, which does sort of keep these things from sliding out too much. That gets placed on there again. And finally, the lid goes on there, locking everything in, and again, everything stays very nicely and will be exactly where you need it for the next time you play. And I'm not going to do all of this on camera because you've already seen that done in the first half of the video, but one last thing I do want to show you is the bottom of the box under all of these trays looks like this. And basically the way it works is each of the minis has a slot here and they sort of alternate 
and it doesn't really matter who goes where so long as you place it in such a way that the rifle of the ranger has somewhere to go, sort of laying on top. In here there are four envelopes that have secret goodies in them. There are extra one of each of the four resource tokens, I guess in case you lose one, I just keep them in there. These are two stacks of where all my extra event cards have been coming from as I play. This is the stack of where all the extra adventure cards come from as I play. In here are all the building cards I don't have access to yet. And on top of those is where all of the goal cards I don't have access to go. The sort of additional season tile I can throw in there if it's not in my player area. My two bags sort of fit in here as needed. I'm not doing it nicely as I would, but they fit nicely in there. Assuming then that I had packed up my tray, which I'm not doing to make you sit there and watch me do it, that goes on top of that. The four character trays go right on top of that. And then on top of all of those, we've got the rule book for the town. We've got the four character rule books as well. And then two more awesome things that come with this game that didn't need to come with it at all are, first, this beautiful glossy art piece. And then also, again, because location doesn't really mean anything in this game, but to pull you in to the game, there's this very beautiful map illustration as well. So basically, that sits in there, those sit there, and on top of that I can put the book like that, and the double books like that, and the lid slides down just like that. Very, very, very nice storage solution, and you'll see that the side of the box actually has a huge cutout to help pull out all of the different trays when it's time to play the game. Huge thumbs up for production quality on this game from me. Now meet me back up top and I'll let you know what I think about the game itself. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the playthrough. For this playthrough, I did want to sort of give you a little bit of a taste of everything in here. So there's a lot going on and you can sort of get a taste for how everything works, but also to help you sort of understand the rules for each of the different characters and the sort of overall rules for the game itself. So I hope that I was successful in doing all of that, but I didn't want to give away or spoil too much of the sort of hidden adventure and story that comes out of this game as you play through. So I only wanted to give you the glimpse that I gave you. With that said, let's talk about how I feel about this game. There's going to be a lot of sort of ups and downs in this review. If you've ever watched my reviews before, you know I sort of do a train of thought, kind of stream of consciousness, kind of final thoughts on all of these videos. And I want to start off first by saying there's a whole lot of good here and I love what the designers are attempting to do here. The sort of attempt that they've put out and or tried to do in this game, the effort that they've put into doing what they want to do, which is sort of turning a game like Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing into a board game experience, is very appreciated and I love the way that they went about doing it here. Now, I do have to say I don't think it succeeds on all fronts personally because there's still some stuff in here that I'd love to see more of or that I'd love to see matter more, or just a little bit more focus put into the game. But I'll get into all of that soon enough as I get walk through this sort of thoughts on the game. But the first thing I want to talk about, before I get into the, the core of the game, I actually want to start with the characters. There are four characters that come in this game, and they do play quite a bit differently. You've got the farmer that's using this sort of polyomino tile laying game to build out their farm and sell off their goods at market to make money getting new equipment to help do this better, you know, putting livestock on their farm, hopefully breeding the livestock to get that spreading and selling off some of those, but then also using the livestock to use their sort of equipment on the farm to again, increase their efficiencies and so on. You've got this crafter that's a, basically a bag building mechanism where you're putting in different kinds of materials into your bag, pulling them out and then using them to manipulate them through this sort of leveling up mechanism that then refines those materials well enough to use those materials to make goods that then get sold as well. You've got the merchant that is sort of this 
sort of market manipulation econo economics kind of game where selling and buying is changing the prices of goods in the market and you're competing with rivals that are coming in, selling and buying goods, trying to sell goods to customers or outsell each other to customers, and then ultimately trying to take over or buy out these other rival merchants so that you can use them to upgrade your skills and so on, making you an even better merchant moving forward. And then finally you've got this ranger that's sort of completely out of left field that plays very differently to the other characters because they spend most of their time out on expedition and not doing things in the town. And they are sort of walking through, it's a, sort of a card management, hand management kind of thing where you're bringing out cards to go on these expeditions that hopefully match up in the right ways to turn those cards into goods that you can sell later or to use to upgrade things to sort of upgrade yourself so you can bring more cards on future adventures or expeditions and so on. So all four of these play very differently and all four of these feel very differently and all four of these sort of connected with me in different ways. The Farmer is the first one I played and it's definitely the simplest of the four characters but it's also, at least in my opinion, the least exciting of all four characters. I tend to be a fan of spatial puzzles and polyominoes here but it didn't ever really feel like the spatial thing was all that important. You saw in my playthrough, I never cleared out any of the wild land, which is kind of crazy because that means that I was always working within this system, but I kind of prefer that because it's fun to try and fit the pieces in where they need to go. But also, there's not a whole lot going on with the farmer because every time you're planting one by one, you're harvesting one by one, you're tending one by one, until you start to build out this network of livestock and equipment that lets you do things more. And for me, I didn't ever care enough early in the game to put in the effort to make my farm better, to make it more sort of efficient and more productive moving forward. So probably several seasons in or several years in, if I really focus and work hard, then that, that train of this sort of engine moving of this farmer planting and tending and harvesting and planting and tending and harvesting would be more fun. But the amount of sort of work it takes to get there without a whole lot of fun early on, at least for me, because he's not getting a lot of stuff done per turn, just didn't feel all that special to me. And it felt more about planning this long sort of strategic engine build rather than the fun of the polyomino tile placement. So ultimately the farmer fell a little bit flat for me. If I'm going in order of the ones that I enjoy, I think the next one is probably the merchant. I really love the way the merchant system works. I think this idea of two rival merchants and customers coming in and going out and you sort of competing with the merchant to see who gets to sell stuff to the customer and sort of manipulating the, the values of things in the market by selling things and buying things and then using your sort of trend action to make things go a little better or a little worse to to sort, of, to sort of push the market to make it so that you sell to the customer rather than the, mar the merchant or the rival merchant. And it's really fun when you have enough money to buy out a merchant and say, ha ha, now you're gone, bye bye, and now I get to use you to upgrade something and do something. And the idea of it is really fun. And I do enjoy the merchant, but there are a couple of things. One is that the, the trending stuff is always little upticks and little downticks. Now, probably I should have been upgrading more than I have when I played the merchant, but it did still feel a little bit smaller than I'd like, but also I found out very, very quickly, after a year or so, I was making so much money with the merchant that I sort of wasn't needing to do anything. It was just sort of, I got this engine running, I had all of the goods up at high prices, and as long as I kept them up there, I was getting lots of money, and it was just becoming a sort of do it again, do it again, do it again kind of system, and it became less fulfilling or interesting. The next one that I want to talk about is my next favorite is the Ranger. And this one is interesting for me because I really enjoy this one just for how sort of off the wall crazy this idea is that it plays so much differently to the other. This idea of which resources to bring kind of push your luck. Do I use things now to get things? Do I hold on to them to see maybe look ahead or predict things or split my path to go give me a choice of where I'm going based on the items I have and then sort of evolving or leveling up my ranger so I can bring more stuff with me on the next expedition and so on was a lot of fun and it's really interesting. But the problem is you sort of lose out on the town actions for a lot of the stuff because especially when I was playing solo with one character, when I played the ranger one character, he was gone most of the time so I wasn't really doing much in town 
And that sort of took away from part of the core mechanisms of the game, so it did feel a little bit sad that he was gone as much as he was, but as a secondary character, he's a lot of fun because the other guy can do all of the town stuff while he's off on these expeditions, and I did really enjoy that. Now, the other thing that's a little bit unfortunate for the ranger, but there's not much you can do with the sort of mechanisms as presented, is that the expeditions don't, for the most part, really feel any different from time to time. Yes, they get a little longer. Yes, they get a little harder but they still feel like the same sort of core loop. And it would have been interesting to see that as they got longer or as they got more challenging, that sort of new twists or new things came into those, those sort of expeditions that he's going on. And I don't know quite how you do that, but I would love to see more variety in the kinds of things that happened while they were on their expeditions. And finally, my favorite of the four is the crafter, simply because I tend to be a really big fan of bag building, and I do really enjoy the puzzle here of what do I put in when to make things trigger, which of the different things can I be crafting, which of my sort of reputations should, be, should I be upgrading so that when I focus on those crafts I make more money. And it's just a really cool loop of getting resources into the bag, pulling resources out, manipulating them so that they move up the track, selling them at the right times to get certain abilities triggered or to get more money or to eventually start putting these things together to make things to sell as crafts. Really, really cool system. I like the crafter a lot and that's the one that I've played with most in this box. And probably if I was going to play again and say to somebody, this is the one that I really like to play, that's the crafter for me. And realistically, yes, there are different difficulty levels for all of them, but none of them felt all that challenging. Sure, the farmer is much easier than the other three, but realistically, after a season or two, you should be sort of comfortable enough with the game to play any of these characters and enjoy playing those characters. So then there's the core game. And the core game, aside from all of the stuff that the characters are doing, is basically going on adventures, building up your town, and triggering events along the way. That's basically the things you're doing, because most of the buildings that you're building on the map are there to get resources, or exchange resources, or get you more workers, or manipulate the workers that you're getting from the tower into town. And all of that is either to build more buildings, or to make your sort of character actions better using those worker characters. So realistically, the main things to talk about here are the adventures, the events, and the buildings. Well, the idea of building buildings is a really, really fun one that I have to work on all of my stuff to get money or to get resources, well, to get money to buy resources for the buildings, but also to go on adventures to find resources for the buildings, to also progress on these goals that I'll talk about again in a minute to get resources to build buildings, or to build buildings that produce resources that I can then use to build buildings. And this is a lot of fun at the beginning because you start with this big empty town and you're slowly filling in all these spots with buildings that are giving you different resources or allowing you to manipulate the resources or the dice, the worker dice, in different ways, and it's a lot of fun. The problem is, after two years, maybe three years, it starts to sort of flatten out because the buildings are there to basically help you build more buildings. And after you get to a certain point, some of the buildings, I didn't, you didn't see any of this in the playthrough, but some of the buildings have a little rotation mark on them. And what that means is when they're built, they replace another building, which I really appreciated because then I saw this chain of progression that I make this replaces that, then I make this replaces that, and I can keep going until I get to the end of that chain, and that's great. But many of the buildings don't do that. Many of the buildings take a space, which means in order to build the building after I filled the town, I need to destroy something else. And that's not always great. Like I'm destroying something else could mean now I don't have the prerequisite for something later. So I have to be careful about what I'm destroying. But also, the things that the buildings do are not really all that different. It's usually just like an iterative addition to what they're already doing, but slightly better or slightly cheaper. And the more I built, the less important it became for me to build them except to say, hey, I built that building. So I almost wish that more of those higher level buildings were automatic replacement that was just an upgrade from the previous buildings because then I didn't really have to think about destroying old things. It was just always about level up, level up, level up. It would be much more of, a, of an interesting progression or at least just a more straightforward check off the box as you move through kind of progression. This is what I need to do in order to do this and this is why I'm playing the game. 
But when you get to the point where the buildings are giving you resources that you don't really need because you're not really building buildings anymore, and you don't really want to build new buildings because you're not really changing or building on anything, you get this loop of, I don't need buildings, so I don't need resources, and I don't need resources, so I don't need to use the buildings, and then the buildings are just kind of there and don't do anything unless an event or an ad adventure triggers something because of a building that you've built, which did happen sometimes. But realistically, early game, this felt lots of fun, and late game, it was just kind of like, mm, I don't care anymore. The adventure system as well. When you go on these adventures, there's a short little story, but the stories, for the most part, don't do all that much in the adventure, and that's because they're just little snippets. You went out, you saw this guy, he gave you this thing. You went out, you paid this guy some money, and he got you this thing. You went out and you found a sprite that was hurt, so you helped them and you got this thing. And it's mostly, again, about getting resources, about getting money, and ultimately it's the same loop. Well, what do I use the money for? I can use the money to buy resources to build buildings, but if I don't need to build buildings and I don't need resources, then I don't need the money. And now I'm generating all this money, so what am I doing with all of this money? Nothing. It just starts accumulating. After you've played through the first few years, it just felt to me like I was running the gears without much focus because there was nothing else to do except to build buildings and to level up my characters. And ultimately, while the mechanisms were fun, once I sort of started maxing out stuff, and this was way before I'd made it through most of the event deck, or at least more than half of the event deck. But I just didn't have the drive to push through because it was just rotating the gears without any kind of goal except these end of season goals. And the end of season goals are not bad, but they're often very easy to, to, to match, at least as you progress in the game and you've already sort of gotten all your resources maxed because you're not buying any buildings. So anytime a resource one thing comes out, well, you've got that pretty much. Once the buildings are all filled, anything that's building related is pretty easy to accomplish. So it just got to the point where the goals were sort of somewhat automatically happening with a little bit of effort on my, own, on my part. I didn't care about building buildings. I had all this money that I wasn't spending on anything. And it was just kind of like, okay, now what? But then there's the event deck, and I want to focus on the event deck for a minute because the event deck is the sort of core story of the game. And I'm sure that some people are going to complain that there didn't really, isn't really much that happened, but I appreciate the story that happened here. I like the story that was playing out in the events. I do like sometimes that the events introduced some adventure cards that did then trigger specific things based on things that had happened before. So it did feel like the world was living and you were involved in there and things were happening based on decisions you made. Now, it's not groundbreaking because it's not like this huge epic story. It's very much a daily, day-to-day -day life kind of thing. But at some point, some things start happening and you know that there's secret envelopes in there, so they're connected to something. There is a through line to the story that does relate to sort of the history of this valley and things that have happened past and things that are happening now. And it does get a little bit more interesting as you dig into that kind of stuff. And the end game of end of the story and the end of this game does throw in a little bit of twist at the end that makes me excited to see more of the story of this world. But the problem was after about six years of playing this game, I mean six times four or 24 rounds of playing this game, I'd basically done everything I wanted to do except there was a, a good stack of event left that I hadn't seen and I wanted to see it. Now, if you enjoy rotating the gears without much of a goal, then you can keep doing that and playing out the event. But the event you're seeing like three or four cards every season and there's a lot of event cards in here. So it got to the point where I was just like, okay, I don't need to do these gears anymore. And I sort of just played like a choose your own adventure read through of the rest of the event cards. And I'm glad I did because I enjoyed how the story played out but I would not have sat through more and more and more years to get to the end of that story. So for me, unfortunately, there's just not enough pushing me. I want to see more stuff. Even if it's meaningless stuff, I want to see more stuff that I'm focused on getting done while I'm playing. It would be nice, and I've seen that the upcoming expansion is already looking at this, to see the different character classes interacting with each other in some way, that the crafter might sell their goods at the market, or that the farmer might sell their goods at the market, or that the ranger might go out on an adventure and bring something back that helps the crafter, or bring something back that helps the farmer, and so on and so on. So it would be nice to see some interactivity between the characters, but ultimately I want more in the core game. I want more happening in a town. I want more reason to have resources. I want more reason to have money that isn't just getting skills and building buildings. 
I, even if it's something silly, like playing Animal Crossing, half of that game is collecting bugs, collecting different kinds of fish. If there was some kind of goods, items that I could collect that I just could find or that I could pay for with my money and that that became a mechanism where even if it's a meaningless goal, I need to spend 20 coins on this thing to get this card with a cool picture on it. And if you give me a deck of 50 pictures and I can't see that picture until I pay the cost on the back of that card, it's silly, but it gives me reason to keep earning money. It gives me reason to keep making resources. Just a little fish, just a little carrot at the end of a string that makes me keep doing this stuff is what I'm looking for. And unfortunately, an event at the start of every round is not that because all I need to do is get to the next round. It doesn't matter what I've done in between this event and the next event. So, I just want the world to feel more alive because I enjoy how each of the characters works. I enjoy the building progression. I don't enjoy necessarily what the buildings are doing because they're all focused on resources and, and sprite or worker dice and eventually that plateaus. So give me more goodies to, to reach for. Give me more stuff that I need to find or need to spend money on. Money, money, money. I've got lots of it and nothing to do with it, and I still want to keep going to read the rest of the events, so give me something to spend it on. These kinds of small things are the kinds of things that will push this game to go from a very interesting experiment that was fun to play with to a really, really cool game that means a whole lot to a lot of people. And I think there's just sort of one core town mechanism that's missing here to keep it from getting to that point. Now, for a lot of people, this game could still be a lot of fun because, again, each of these mechanisms is fun to play with. And if you enjoy just tinkering and playing and seeing, setting your own personal goals, how much money can I earn in one season? How, how much can I, can I drop all my resources and how quickly can I refill my resources? Just giving yourself personal goals like that could be fun to keep pushing this game forward. And there are certainly people who sit in front of a game like Stardew Valley or a game like Animal Crossing and just play to play to play and just enjoy inhabiting that world. And that can happen here for sure. But for me, I just needed a little bit more of a something pulling me to keep moving forward and to keep running the gears that I was running. So... Really cool experiment. I'm very glad I got a chance to play with this game, but unless there's just that bit more added in, I don't know that this is a world that I'll be coming back to, unfortunately, despite the beautiful picture or imagery and artwork, despite the kind of cool story of the world as it's growing and evolving and living amongst these different kinds of sprites and creatures. This one, unfortunately, didn't really hook me in. I will keep an eye on it to see what happens next, but for right now, I've had my fun with Mithwin, but that's sort of all that I've got in me for this one. I hope that this video was helpful for you. I hope that if you're a different kind of gamer than me, that you can see the things in this game that might be helpful or might be interesting or fun for you. And if this isn't the kind of game that you're interested in, and I hope that I was able to explain exactly what this game offers so that you can make that decision as well. As always, I do ask that if you did enjoy this video that you please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon below, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks.